love summer. Ladies and gentlemen, back like you owe us money. Woo. Back like vertebrae. Back like that thing we can see from the front. Back like car seats. Back like how far back? Back like Burt Bacharach. I like that right there. I, 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 I think I'm done. I can't, I can't, I can't compete with uh, Burt Bacharach. We would like to welcome you, everyone on IG, everyone you, here, you, to you. the Pass, Pass the, the Bag, bag podcast. podcast. It's not enough for you to get the bag. It will never be enough. Never. You got to know how to keep that bag. And if you want to secure the bag, what you got to do? You got to share, share the, the bag. bag. Now, kindly, please. Pass the bag. I am one half of this dynamic duo, the one that they call Mr. P from the 313, Robert Edward Patterson II. Indubitably. My man, who you be? I am Adrian Black from Danville, Virginia. Put the ill, ill. in Danville. That's right, baby. Let's go. This is PTB season two doing the Where thing. Where we at? Fried. Friggy fried. Fricky, fr- fricky, fr- rice. Fried, fried. NYC. Fried. Indeed. Upper Hills. Home Shen of the dope Jin. fashion. PRC. They got a dope sale going on, 268 for the for their four different classic tees. Check them out. Upper uh, Hills, send them checks. Big shouts to something. Nolan, big shouts to my <coughs> fry right. If you haven't been here yet to this complex, it's a fantastic complex. Great place they to shop. They got the residential up in here. Uh, I don't know how many of those uh, really hip coffee shops that they have. So many. A great you, place to take pictures. Oh, man. Wonderful place to do photo ops. Yeah. Really, really kind of uh, on the tip of the spear for the... Uh, for the for the for the part of the culture that is organic that Shenzhen is carrying on, yeah. Um, so not just uh, people like Fried Rice, but also a lot of other people who come from that community culture, all about community. startup culture, you know. And uh, and Shenzhen is one of those places. We're that, talking about community, you know. You can't talk about Shen, ten, can't talk about Shenzhen without talking about community. Let's do it. So since we're talking about community, we have our own community. That's right, baby. Our own group on WeChat. Pass uh, it. Pass the bag. Pass it on. Podcast group. Uh, right. If you're on WeChat, please. Consider joining our group. That's let right. Mr. P know or let me know. That's right. Just we'll send get us you a in. private message. We'll see what uh, we can do about getting you in. That's right. Because our group gives us a lot of, we have a lot of great dialogue in our group, a lot of great conversations, a lot of great engagement, mm. building community, answering questions, and asking questions. Mm. And uh, a lovely member of our team and also a member of our group, Miss Nicole, and her Instagram is astrolabe underscore mist. Yeah. Bam. And she had a, a great point that we would like to start the pod with today. Let's diggy do it. So. Let's see. And it goes a little something like this. Dear bag pilots, yeah. once upon a bag, there was a question mm. dangling its little legs in wondrous idleness. Are there any parallels between the ancient Roman phenomenon of bread and games for the people and the big sports industry in the U.S.? Awesome question. In ancient Rome, the spectacle of gladiator fights and the char- chariot races engaged the Roman citizens in a way that kept them in a state of acceptance and satisfaction with the permanent imperial affair of war for the sake of expansion. Whoa. 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 That was a big statement. Fast forward to the U.S., especially when the NBA, I feel it's so baffling. It looks very contradictory to me as an outsider. Mm. She's from Germany. Where is she from? Germany. But but where in Germany though? Where Berlin. where in, where in Berlin? Dunch, 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 dunch. Berlin. She is from Oh man. I don't even want to say it. You forgot already. Yeah. Can we tell us again? Berlin Panko. Panko. Shout out shout to Panko. Everybody from. in Panko. Panko. What up? What? So the NBA is dominated by Afro-European athletes who at times get downright worshipped as superhumans. It's true. I love Le- LeBron James. Nice counterweight inside a culture which is racist on an institutional level. Whoa. No. Whoa. She no. Knows. No beating around the no. bush there. <laughs> she said it in the most offensive way possible. That's beautiful. Is this modern mythological sports culture business receiving subventions by forces higher up? Mm. Forces who are acting through this business machine to produce the illusion of equality, mm. who are calculating to pacify, love that word, mm. pacify the people who are potent enough to rally against human equality once human it inequality. Ever, inequality. Mm. Human inequality once it ever becomes too unignorable. End wow. quote. End quote. End quote. Thank you. Thank Nicole. you for that awesome question, Miss Nicole <clears throat> from Germany, from Panko. Shouts to the Bears. And if any of you all at the end of a podcast, uh, in the middle of a podcast, at the beginning of a podcast, you ever feel so inclined 
to uh, continue these types of critical dialogues. We encourage you to do so. Go ahead, send in whatever it is that you want to say. Pass the bag podcast at gmail.com right. or hit us up in the WeChat group or hit us up on <laughs> IG at Pass the Bag Podcast. Or Twitter at So Pass let's the get bag into pod. this. Um, right. Man, that is that question is amazing. And bread and games. Bread and games. And so I was really thinking about <laughs> this, like when you asked the question, because the NBA has, is set to open back up now on July 31st. And Say what? The first group. Say what? The NBA is opening back up on July 31st. You know, that's a worldwide, and, worldwide and so event. so 22 teams are all going to all going to Orlando, to Walt Disney. They're building a the campus just for the NBA. How many teams? 22 teams. Out of 30. Out of 30. Bringing them back. And so the reason why I felt like what, what Nicole said was so poignant was that when, it, when I thought about it, it was like, they're going to be basketball games all day. Because they're all playing at this one site. There's not, there's not going to be multiple courts. There's going to be one court That's right. set up. So they're going to be basketball games all day. So how many people that are protesting now are not going to be outside protesting? So they can go back in. Once the NBA starts. Basketball. Luckily, we have technology where you can watch the NBA on your phone, right? You That's could be true. in the middle. If you got that package. If you got if that you package. you got it like that. You could be out there with your sign watching the game like... Kawhi just scored. <laughs> Kawhi putting up buckets. Let's go. In the middle of the speech, you know, Fuck somebody's this shit. rallying against Fuck you. This oh, shit. oh, oh, I mean, um, I mean. But, but it yeah. also, it also, I also thought about that a lot of, a lot of the first people leading some of the most, pe- some of these peaceful protests yes, were sir. NBA players. Man, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar back in the Malcolm day. Malcolm Brog. I mean, but even now. Oh, like, oh okay. Malcolm Brogdon. Um. What's uh my, my what about that brother who got uh, is, is that the brother Jalen uh, Brown is, is Malcolm is Malcolm that brother who got tased in Milwaukee? No, no, no that's the, somebody else. Yeah. That's somebody or, else. Or maybe but he didn't he, get tased, but, but yeah, but he, yeah, it, he still he still has a lawsuit out against the uh, Milwaukee the state uh, of Milwaukee, yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, hey, big shout out to Rachel by the way who just came into the building. Rachel's you know what I'm here. saying? Big yeah. shout out to all our PAs. We got a new that's PA, right. Jerry, aka Miss Danielle. Yeah, uh, yeah. Big shouts to her. Thank yeah. you so much. Shouts to New Orleans. University, what up, Marrero? University of New Orleans. What up, Marrero? Yeah. So it, it's a it's a big it's a big conversation because I think the key the key word I saw in that phrase was pacify. Pacify. Like the and the, and for those who might not know what that necessarily means, pacify is when you give somebody a little bit of something so they can just shut up. You know how you got your kid. Your kid and it's crying mm-hmm. and it's going crazy and you give them that little thing called a pacifier mm-hmm. and they start sucking on it and then they're quiet again. Yeah, man. I um I really do uh, appreciate Nicole for sending us uh, at us and uh, really helping us to be able to carry on a dialogue because it's important, you know, for my brother Black here and myself to make sure that we're not just two, uh, you know, so-called angry black guys talking about this or talking about that. And I've even said it, you know, there's a lot of other things that I would uh, rather be talking about. But at a time like now, uh, it will be irresponsible uh, for us not to do uh, to do so. And it's not just about you all listening to us. It's about us listening to one another. You know, it's about us really understanding the way that we're using our voices, where our passion lies, uh, where it is that, you know, what our actual perspectives on these situations are versus us to just agree on everything, you know, where we agree, where we disagree, uh, acknowledging one another's perspectives and experiences, you know, because that is how we get over the hump, especially when you talk about oppression, you know, because oppression, uh, one of the things, one of the tools of oppression is exclusion. You know, and that's part of how you divide folks and conquer folks. When folks are divided, they are not listening to one another. When folks are divided, they are not sharing their voices. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is one of those things that's, that's, that's really lo- lovely. I appreciate Nicole keeping her uh, perspective, putting her perspective inside of there. You know, as an outsider looking at that situation, just straight up racist system, pacifying folks, entertaining them. And I, and I feel like the NBA, yeah. you know, we're going to talk a little bit. We, later we got the ball back. Yep. And we go, we go, really gonna get into this bread. The game NBA situation. does a much better job than of, some other than organizations. Some other organizations, and I think that <laughs> the NBA, <laughs> NBA players understand. I think because their their game is without a helmet, mm-hmm. you know. That's right. Um, and you can see them. That's right. And they're so present mm-hmm. on social media, mm-hmm. and they they NBA. NBA athletes build their brand better than any other athlete in the world. It's also so much more of an international game. It's so much more. Except yeah. for maybe outside of, uh, outside football, of football, like world football. Yeah. But in uh, terms of in the States. In the States, though. It's the most it's worldly the most, game that we have in the States. Exactly. 
And, and uh, there's a lot of bridges that come from that. And I feel like the NBA players, especially the especially like LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul, for example, um, so many, so many NBA players use their platform as a way to speak out against injustice and speak out <laughs> against uh, some of the things that are plaguing um, underprivileged communities throughout yeah. the world. Yeah, I want to take that. I want to take that moment to uh, also give another shout out to another uh, uh, <laughs> another uh, Louisiana great, you know. And uh, we did it uh, last uh, podcast, but um, you know I feel like it's worthy because we're talking about the NBA. The only the only rapper to ever play in the NBA. <laughs> Make him say, uh, <laughs> "Shout out to the tank." Uh, well, the only rap the only rapper that was a rapper before he went to the NBA because uh, there's rapper rappers in the NBA. To, <clears throat> that's true. He was a rapper a before rappers he went to the NBA. NBA, but he was a ball player in uh, in college. Actually, that's he a great a bag that we got to do one day. Oh man, we got we got to rank man. the best NBA. Best ball player and rappers. <clears throat> That's coming at y'all. That we're gonna do that maybe next pod. That's listen, y'all. Somebody write that down. Write let's that get, down. Listen, 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 let's do this, man. Rank the ball playing rappers. Let's do this. Let's write that down. Let's do All right. This. It's it's an amazing conversation. Please join our conversation. Join our WeChat group. Be a part of the team, and and pass that bag. And let let's let's get into the first bag. Let's get into the first bag for let's go for ahead today. And reach, and reach in here we'll and uh, see what we pull out. It's one of my favorite times of year. What time is it? It is June, and June is designated as Pride Month. Pride in the building. June 4th is officially Pride Day. All my rainbow folks stand so up. So we got the rainbow bag. The rainbow the bag, The rainbow baby. bag. It's a bag made That's of rainbows. Right. Rainbow tribe. You can, put, you can put all types of love in that bag. Yo, big shout out to the rainbow tribe holding it down. Indeed. Carrying that thing forward, you know, when you talk about striving for equality, yeah, you talk about striving for uh, having your authentic self to be honored and recognized and realized. What's in the rainbow bag today, sir? We want to take take time to celebrate the LGBTQIA plus community. All of that. All that. All of that. All those. All, all those letters. Boom. The alphabet boys. Not those. Not them. Not them. <laughs> but um, I've been. Everybody is nowadays. It's very. There's protests happening all over the world. Case you didn't know. Case you didn't know. All over the world, literally all over the world right now. Brother and, Floyd uh, <laughs> brought him out, didn't he? <laughs> and one of the exactly. And one of the one of the initial. Um, one of the first human uprisings. One of the first human rights. Not first, but one of the. Well, yeah. I feel like it's very big. Anyway, I won't even try to explain. Man, come on, come on, say it. Stonewall, say, that shit. say it, say it. Stonewall riots happened in New York in uh, <laughs> in a little in a little place called Greenwich Village. Where's that? In, in 1969, it's in New York, uh-huh. New York City, uh-huh. and it it was one of the catalysts for the beginning of the U.S. gay rights movement. Stonewall riots, and it happened on Wikipedia. June 28th, and so. June was designated as Pride Month because of you know this one of these things that happened, mm-hmm. and it was organized by a young lady named by by a transgender young lady named Marsha P. Johnson, mm-hmm. who was black, and her friend Sylvia Rivera, who was a Latina. And in case y'all didn't notice, let's get, you want to give them a little bit of context, a little history about yeah. the way that they was kicking it off. Yo, Greenwich Village was yeah. one of the first places in the United States that was what you would call. Uh, like a real safe space, a real deal community cradle for individuals who were queer, let alone people who were just straight up gay, let alone people who were cross dressers, mm-hmm. transgender, or drag queens. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Greenwich Village was one of those first places where, when you wanted to let your freak flag fly, you just be yourself. Greenwich Village was the place to go. And uh, for those of you who, uh, uh, who really like that kind of uh, deal, the village people, you know, when you look at the village folks, uh, everybody knows the YMCA. Hit them with the. Mm, 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 mm. They came right up out of the Greenwich Village. They were. I at, didn't know that. that that's true. That's the village awesome. people well, come up out of Greenwich the village. village. Yeah, absolutely. The village people. And they were a, a, a celebration of you know that's why they have the the that's the gay cowboy, the gay biker, the the whole the whole deal. Right. So they were celebrating. They were carrying on the 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 village spirit. That's why right. they were the village people. Right. Greenwich Village. Boom. NYC. A little bit piece of history for you. Sixty nine. Okay. So it it brought me to the first question. Yeah, yeah. Is it? It's it's great that it was 1969 too, right? Isn't it though? Back in the summer of 69. 69. <laughs> All right. Is it more important for different disadvantaged groups to come together in their fight for equality? Hmm. I mean, wait a second. 
Is it more important for the different disadvantaged groups to come together? Or do you think? Do you home? think? So the question is, I guess it's a compare or contrast. Right. Is it is it better to fight separately? And say like, no, this is a black issue. Only black people should fight for it. This is a gay issue. Only gay people should fight for it. Only gay <clears> people <throat> should stand on the front lines and bang on our chest for these things. Man, I think it's a great question because it gives me uh, the ability to be able to say something that I feel like is important to remind people of. I didn't invent it, but I do love saying it. Mm-hmm. That it depends on the details, right? Right. You know, detail orientation gets lost a lot, especially when people can get uh, 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 rocked to sleep with their bread and their games, right? You know, some people are, um, you know, really missing the opportunity to be able to go uh, into a situation and say, you know, what are the details of a situation? Right. How do I make sure that I have a comprehensive understanding of the issue? Because it might be by ha- them having a comprehensive understanding of the issue, they can understand how it's not their place to get into somebody else's mix, mm. you know? Right. A lot of times people, they might just say, you know, when they only have surface knowledge, yeah, or right. when they only have a very uh, remedial understanding of the situation, to put it in academic language, right? Right. They might say, oh, yeah, you know, this is a, a line thing, and, you know, we're all on the same boat, when they really don't know the details of this boat next to that boat. Right. So I feel like this is a great opportunity to say, no, this is one of those types of things where in order to be able to say that it's uh, better or uh, uh, less appropriate, right? right. That's, that's the thing. People get in there and, and really learn, you know, what, what, what is the, uh, the detail of the situation, and then you can say whether it is or not. Right. I like that. I like that perspective because the devil's in the details is what they say, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And t- in order to mm-hmm. truly understand somebody's perspective, it takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of, a lot of work. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of uh, openness you and, be and questioning. You got to be listening. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, people don't want to do that especially nowadays everybody has an opinion everybody has a blog everybody has a as it has a and i and i support that Mm -hmm. i think everyone's voice is important Mm -hmm. however i think it's also important to recognize that some issues are are more important to certain individuals than they are to other individuals absolutely true and because of that sometimes linking together isn't necessarily the best way to make sure all of your issues are heard. And all, you know what? Remember we talked about the drama triangle so many episodes back when we talk about the drama triangle. Is that in the last episode or did we No, that's that in the first one? one. All right, great. So uh, when we talk about the drama triangle, there are situations, real life situations, where people need to make sure that they're not playing the hero for other groups. Right. You know, like that's important. That's like when you, your child, you got a baby, your baby fall down. You know, you can't always be picking your baby up. The baby got to learn to get up on his right. own. Right. If that is in context here, but I'm no, just I'm with you. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you on that. I'm with you on that. It, and that's a, and also it's like I've I was watching. Uh, I think Trevor Noah. I love Trevor Noah. Shouts to him. Big and, sh- South Africa stand up. And he was and he was speaking about how sometimes disenfranch- disenfranchised white people now mm. that come from a uh, poor socioeconomic status mm-hmm. like to link their struggle to the struggle of the things that I've heard him say so that called he does a great job so called black that. people yeah. right or so called yeah specifically so called black people he does a great job Afro- of articulating that <laughs> and the reason and 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 what he said was it really spoke to me because the afro european that lives in america now has been dealing with the issues of racism separatism um economic injustice for darn near 500 mm-hmm. years now at this yeah. point. Trevor Noah be talking that shit. And so <laughs> if I can, I can understand that as a disenfranchised white person, yeah, you'd be like, I, I have privilege, but what does that even mean? Like, I, I'm still struggling just like you are. But the systematic oppression of your people hasn't been the same as it would be for someone who's Afro-European. You've heard me say it once, and it's not going to be the last time that I say it because it's important until, you know, other voices are voicing this thing too. Right. Man, I feel like, um, how you call it, um, like, that part where you say uh, what, what people are commenting, people who don't have a, a real deal understanding, like, they don't know what racism is. Mm. But they're talking about racism, or they're talking about things that are, you know, like, that, that kind of voice to me, like, there's a ton of people out there, so-called white folks, so-called black folks, they talk about racism, but they don't have a, they don't know what racism is. Mm. They don't have a, compre- they think that all bigotry is, they think that all bigotry is racism. Right. No. Racism employs bigotry, mm. right? But all bigotry isn't racism. Fact. So for people who feel like just because there's some bigotry going on, that bigotry just automatically fits into the box of racism, that's, that's not the case. And right. that's only one example of the ways that 
people are really either harming themselves and harming specific movements, right? And that goes into the uh, answer to the question, right? People, uh, a lot of people are misinformed. And just, I mean, it could be me, right? I don't have to be right. Right. right, I, would right. I would rather be wrong and learn how to, you know, step correctly on the other side of being wrong right. than, you know, feel like I got to protect, you know, oh, I feel like I'm right and right. I'm out here, you know, walking around. Yeah, I, like, I, like, I, like I, I have a fool. vulnerable moment. Uh, shouts to Drunk History. I was watching a Drunk <laughs> History uh, YouTube, YouTube video about uh, Cleopatra's little sister, Arsen Arsenoa. Yeah, all right. Who was bad at this 11 year old, sure, sure. 11 year old who like whooped some, Julius. It's like some Beyonce Solange type. Yeah, thing. yeah, like 11 year old young lady who was actually the rightful ruler of uh, Egypt at that time. Yeah, okay. With her older brother, Ptolemy. 11 years old, Julius Caesar comes in. Obviously, we know the story. Cleopatra puts it on him. Egypt, stand up. They build an alliance where she was like coming back to like reclaim her throne after her brother, who was also her husband, had kicked her out. And so, little sister, they in turn, when they got kicked out by Caesar, she went, she had her, uh, she had her, uh, she actually had a Munich who was like her, who was like yeah, her that's goon. How, that's how they did it. Yeah. She was her goon. And uh, he killed the leader of the rebel army, and then they went back and took had Caesar running up in the in the tower. You know, that's like one of the seven wonders of the yeah, world. Yeah. And he ended up having to take off his like his purple cloak all right. and like jumping into the sea. Yeah. Anyway, it I tell all that Caesar story. <laughs> Great story. Look it up. Drunk history. Shouts to them. Hey. But the reason I said that because I was watching the video and I was looking at all the people that were portrayed as Egyptian at the time, and yeah. a lot of them didn't look like me or didn't look like you, and I, I felt some type of way about that. Gotcha. And then, so I commented on the video, like, it's a great video, but why are the Egyptians white? Holla at me. And then so a young man responded, I don't even know if it was a man, I think it was a man, uh, responded to me and was like, actually, you know, the leaders at that time, they were mostly like Macedonian Greek, the people that were ruling Egypt at the time. Like, so I went in, Went down a, a internet rabbit hole of like looking at Ptolemy's uh, family tree the and yeah, and all that. Yeah, they were and like a lot of them yeah. were like Sir had Syrian influence, Macedonian, Greek. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't have looked like you or I. They would have looked more like exactly how they were depicted. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be honest enough with myself to Man, say, Man, I really appreciate I don't what know, you're saying right now. I, I really appreciate what you're saying right now. I don't know everything about everything that I think that I know something I really about. Appreciate, I'm one of the I'm, I'll tell you something, man. And I had, I had to really check myself this morning. And that was this big morning. Up, that was today. Big up to you. I was, I'm, one, I'm one of the first people who, especially in the States, when people start tripping on the, uh, you know, they go on, a, they riding the Hotep Dragon and the, mm. you know, the Egyptology, like yada, yada, yada. I hear, I hear some really outrageous stuff right. coming uh, from this, like, the, and I get it. I get where that narrative is formed from and right. where that stream of consciousness comes from, especially when you come from groups of people who your identity has been taken from you. Right. You've been giving a false identity. The right. false identity that you've been given is right. one that's telling you. That begins that, in slavery. Yeah, right, sure. And right. then, and th so what it is is that, you know, you're looking for anything that's going to help you to feel better about yourself. You right. Know? So now you got all of this, you know, these narratives, crazy narratives, you right. know, that I understand. I understand them right. because people are looking for a path to be able to feel better about themselves. For sure. And then you want an identity. And then you want also, a history. And then there also comes a point where it's like, come on, fam. Right. Come on. And I had to I had to even take a step back to say, you know, what we we become so racialized nowadays. Like back then Who's like that we? You know that. I like to I think I like the, to the, the, the Afro um, European American. The states states. The states and yeah. the states side. Yeah. And the states have become so engulfed in the conversation of race and history and what it means. Bamboozle, baby. That Dancing on a string. Back back then, none of that really mattered, man. There was like, of course, there were like political alliances. Mm -hmm. There, and you know, there's alliances. Of course, there was like, mm -hmm. and of course, there was racism. Like, it's been around forever. But it didn't mean the same thing that it means now after Shadow. I got to say this. Yeah. It's amazing. We're still in the rainbow bag. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the rainbow bag. <laughs> We're in the rainbow, the rainbow it, bag. It went there, saying. though. It by, went by, there. By, exam by, by examining, let's take a look. And that's the thing. And, and, and I've, I've had to educate myself about the rights of the LGBTQIA right community. On. And I've come to change my beliefs about what I feel is right, what I feel is wrong, what mm -hmm. I feel is natural. Mm -hmm. You know, like to discriminate on somebody because of, you know, who they were born as or like for us to try to 
uh, police people's genders and police people's ideas of who they are. That's just ridiculous. I, I, I feel like you're answering the second question, which is what pride means to you. What does pride mean to me? Pride means to me that people, love is love, and that people should be able to love and care for and believe in whatever the, they want to believe in, and that's it. Let me tell you something. I have a memory going back. I want to give a shout-out to uh, take this opportunity to give a shout-out to some of my, uh, my blood relatives, you know, my kinfolk, uh, number one, you know, my two nephews. Xavier Maine, you know, uh, uh, Prince uh, Green. Y'all two youngins, I hope that y'all tuning in, spread this around. But outside of that, uh, I have uh, a cousin. Yeah. Uh, this was my father's first cousin, I want to say, Vera. And, uh, and um, Vera, uh, yo, Nicole is leaving, y'all, so we got to give peace. Thank you. Bye. Boom. Uh, and Vera, uh, Vera was married. I can't remember what Vera's uh, husband was. but So this is like my, my father's first cousin. And then, uh, you know, the, the children of uh, Vera, uh, Bobo, and, you know, the whatever, right? So I, had, so I used to, I used to get, get babysat uh, by my first cousin. What, they actually had, like, a manservant. This is the first queer person that I can remember, like, openly queer person in my life. Yeah. And um, I want to say that the brother's name was Charles, if I'm not. Uh, oh, man. His name was, uh, was just in my mind. But I can remember this, where it was like a thing, where it was like, you know, we would get dropped off over there, and he was, you know, like flamboyant and like whatever, whatever. And 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 his place in the household, uh, as like a manny, right, like a man nanny or whatever, was pretty much as a direct result of him being persecuted, right, out in the world. Oh wow! Because you know, right, like if you're a you know feminine, you know, openly gay individual inside of. You know, the, the what time? What time was this, this? This is this the eighties. Yeah, just the eighties. So I can remember when, they, when when persecuting gay people was like yeah the yeah, thing yeah, to do yeah yeah was, yeah. So I can remember you know they used to leave us uh 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 you know he was like there he was like in the household he was like the butler the he did like every damn thing in the house right you know uh and 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 I never really you know took a took a step back to examine now I can remember there was that sort of narrative around like, oh, you know, my man is a little bit different. What's different about him or whatever, you know what I mean? But, hey, I'm going to tell you this. When I was hungry, I got fed. Nice. Right? When I was dirty, you know what I mean? Like, we got cleaned, you know what yeah. I mean? When we needed something, like, my man was on it. So, right. like, that sort of introduction uh, for me was, like, was, was there. So know, what does that part. say to you about pride? What does that mean to you? I mean, you know, for me, man, um, I'm, like, I'm like this. So many people, they do this when they need to be doing this, mm. right? Like, in the end, everybody, people have free will. People had a, they had their own lessons. Right. They had their own paths. Right. You know, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't play that oppression where I get angry about it. Right. Like, for me, pride is like some warrior type-ish. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, speak that. Yeah, because in the end, there's a lot of fights that somebody brings to you. Mm -hmm. And they're not fights that you go out looking for. Right. Right. The righteous fight. Yeah. The, so when you have individuals who all they want to do is love who they want to love or express themselves the way that they want to express themselves. Right. And then what's happening? They got somebody coming at them, bringing heat to them. You right. know what I'm saying? Bringing a fight to them. Right. You know, in the end, I feel like, you know, pride helps to put me in touch with that, you know, sense of anger or whatever, because, that, yeah, that's, that's the, that was the fight back against that type of injustice man that's so that's that's what a successful campaign against uh oppression in a lot of ways yeah. looks like it has a can lot I, of can i can i speak to the kids real quick man Let's, what's up, i want to speak to, i want to speak to the children because i grew up in a family where i had i had limited male influences all right i had more i had much more Feminine influences than I had masculine influences, all right, all right. and most of my masculine influences came from TV and film. All right. So, I grew up mm. a very feminine child right. and very in touch with my emotions. Right on. And I developed an emotional vocabulary very early. Okay. And I'm so thankful for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when we had this conversation about pride, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because I was very feminine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, People tried to use that as a as a weapon. They tried okay. to weaponize my feminine femininity against me, Sorry as that something was wrong with Sorry me. Sorry to hear that. As if something was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are a young man or, or a young woman, and you just so happen to be a little <laughs> bit more feminine or more masculine than your other counterparts, mm. and people try to use that against you, like don't. It's a strength. It's a strength to be in tune 
with the yeah. masculine energy and the feminine energy within inside of yourself yeah. because it will help you connect with people in a way that you might not have been able to connect with them. And other people will be sitting on the sidelines sometimes when you have an opportunity to connect and grow with people and build your network and build your tribe. And there's plenty of other people out there in the world just like you. So don't, don't take it for granted. And some people might use it to ridicule you now, but it is a strength. And, and you, you can you, use it as a strength. And if you haven't hit puberty yet and you just happen to be attracted to the opposite sex, everybody who was ridiculing you will soon be wishing it was you because you're going to have all the girls. <laughs> you're just going to have a natural magnetism. For sure. And uh, High probability of that. And just be yourself, man. And that's what pride means to us. Hit that and we're patch. just so happy to be celebrating Pride Month. Hit that cabbage and shouts to all the people, the members of the LGBTQIA plus community. And uh, we love you guys. Let's get into the next bag. Yeah, yeah. We still live. Thank you for checking in with us on IG. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, listening to the podcast. Let's get into the bag of pearls. The bag of the pearls. The bag of pearls. I'm so happy that we got some music topics today because if you don't know, Mr. P and I are both musicians. A We're bit. both uh, artists in our own right. And so, so tell them about tell them about your the bag the 90s. of pearls. The bag of pearls. What's in that bag? You know, um, we go digging through the bag of pearls. In order for us to get to the pearls, we got to go past a little bit of Nirvana. You know. Yeah, some some sound um, garden. down a hole, even. Uh, you know, past the Stone Temple Pilots, and then eventually uh, you get to. A great, a great, a great An musical amazing, organization. Amazing uh, musical organization. I would say behind uh, Parliament Funkadelic and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, probably the best uh, uh, band that the United States has. Just pure band, okay? Per I, I know, I know. That's what I would say. The James Brown band, my boy. It's been a long time. All right, respect. respect. Yeah, yeah. P I'm with you, though. P-Funk and, and, and Red Hot Chili Peppers, they'll suit up and still suit up in Rock and Show. Pearl Facts. Jam, y'all. Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam. They released years and years and years and years after the fact, just recently, they released um, the uncensored version of the video for Jeremy, which was uh, a, a, a single off of their uh, debut album. Ten. Ten, which was an amazing album. 91. Uh, go back and listen to it. It is timeless music. Uh, and the reason why this is significant is because this video uh, showed an adolescent youth who, uh, in front of his uh, classmates, uh, at the uh, he, he kills himself. He puts yeah. a gun in his mouth, shoots himself in front of all of these students. Now, back in the day, MTV, yeah. them being the brave pioneers that they were, censored this video. <laughs> they were like, oh, you guys want to talk about uh, youth suicide and, um, you know, uh, uh, and show art? that really uh, uh, gets into it in an unfiltered way. No, we're not with that. We don't want to address youth suicide because, oh, this is too violent or, you know, people might not understand it or whatever. And so Pearl Jam uh, and the label, you know, then forced them into a situation where they had to, they chose to uh, release this censored version. So now we talk about, fast forward, it's 2020. It's 25, 30 years later. Yeah. And... Pearl uh, Jam is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now. Big time Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If you don't know, uh, Pearl Jam is just, just check them out. So I felt like this was a good uh, bag for us to get into. Um, there was 15,208 deaths linked to gun violence in the U.S. in 2019 with another 29,501 people injured, according to the Gun Violence Archive, and a total of 417 mass shootings Jeez. that took place in 2019 and this mm. is the united states of america people love their guns yeah but these types of things are not a deterrent so now when we talk about it let's start with the, the first question pro jam making art that was ahead of his time yeah by maybe 30 years or so for sure <laughs> or maybe the people who they were working with were 30 years behind right either way how awesome is pro jam a black bruh no, number one. So <laughs> I went in the 90s, I was listening to hip hop. Mm. So I didn't get exposed to Pearl Jam. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not as exposed to them as maybe I would like, knowing that how much influence they have on rock and roll music right. and how they basically were the rock and roll band of the 90s from the States. In a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. And so I want to go back and listen to a lot more of their music. Sure. But 
I did go through a Wikipedia rabbit hole about Pearl Jam last night. Oh, yeah? So I, oh. I got some history about them that made me hype. Let's do it. Do you know what the per- what their name was before it was Pearl Jam? Yes, I do. You want to say it or you want you want me to say it? Can we say it at the same time? One, two, three. Mookie Blaylock. Number 10. <laughs> number 10. ATL. Yo, shout out to Mookie Blaylock. Who, who is Mookie- in prison right now? Exactly, exactly, which is crazy. <laughs> on a here. vehicular homicide, yo, we want to give a shout out to not only Mookie Blaylock, who's out there serving time, but everybody who's out there serving time. Prison is bad. You don't want to go there. You don't want to do it. Right. But, you know, Mookie Shouts Blaylock. Shouts to Mookie Blaylock. Yeah, yo. yeah. <laughs> so the reason why Pearl Jam's first album is called 10 mm-hmm. is because Mookie Blaylock's Mookie number, Blaylock's number was, was number, number 10. 10. <laughs> and that, that was they do. Blue. That was blue they do. my mind. That's hot, right? When I, when I That's fresh, that. right? Number one, if you don't know who Mookie Blaylock is, look up some YouTube highlights of Mookie Blaylock right now. Yeah, Mookie he was Blaylock easily was one of hard. the best. He was one of the, he was one was of the best hard. point guards in the In NBA. the 90s, yeah. for sure. Anybody would have been happy to have him on his team. He had, Facts. He had much more upsides. Facts. You know, you know what Mookie Blaylock was like a poor man's Isaiah Thomas in a lot facts. of ways. All yep. facts. Yep. All facts. <laughs> oh, oh. Was like, oh, like a poor man's sports Gary, again. <laughs> was like a poor man's Gary Payton. Sorry, we jumped into sports, but it's all good, man. Hey, so but the fact that their their band name was Mookie Blaylock, yeah, before they became Pearl Jam, and then the story that they told about how they got the name Pearl Jam, right? So Better, the lead singer. Mm. His grandma, his great grandma, her name was Pearl. Mm. So, and anyway, he said they used to tell the story that their grandfather used to make this peyote jam, mm. and which is a lie, mm. according to Wikipedia, mm. according to them. They gotcha. like they made it up, but so gotcha. they came up with the name Pearl Jam. But actually, they just took jam from like uh, mm. from what's his name, uh, Neil 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 Young used okay. to jam his songs out 15 and 20 minutes, mm-hmm. and so they just took the pearl and added the jam because yeah, they were really it, influenced it. by Neil Young. Yeah, Neil Young. And so definitely, Pearl Jam is awesome for a lot of ways, and they wanted their fans to be able to pay the best price to come see them perform. Hey, right? Let's get into and it. And I believe in that. Let's I talk believe on. in that. <laughs> talk on and it. so the one of the and so in the '90s, if you ever went to a concert back then, before Live Nation, before um, all these ticket uh, online app ticket apps. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was Ticketmaster. You had to buy your tickets. Uh, hold on. There was who? There was Ticketmaster. And who else was there? And th- who else was there? Ticketmaster. All right. Two, <laughs> and there was Ticketmaster. <laughs> hey, you had you had five options. You had to ticket go master, ticket master, ticket ticket, master, You had to either go through Ticketmaster, uh, Ticketmaster, the master of tickets, or Ticketmaster. Or Ticketmaster. All right. <laughs> so back then, Ticketmaster used to control had a had a monopoly on all of the live music venues. Stranglehold. Throughout America, and they would add their service fees. And they was raping everybody. They were. They Let's were. just keep it gangster. They were they greedy. They were adding service fees for everything. They never played. Ticketmaster never played one show. They were greedy. <laughs> but they were getting paid off of everybody's shows. And please believe it. The employees getting paid? Everybody's nope. getting paid. No. The, uh, the, the bands? Nope. No. It was just another classic uh, type of situation where the executives and the shareholders just uh, do as much as they can. Um, and the people who are actually doing the work, well, they bear the brunt of the activity. Uh, and in some cases, you know, they get paid less once those people's uh, salaries go up. So, And Pearl that was Jam, one of the best thing about Pearl Jam because Pearl Jam believed in standing for something. They always they used their platform to speak against injustice, whether that be environmental, whether that be through uh, money. Yeah, uh, yeah, you win that, that Wikipedia hole, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I win it. I read they, the they whole page. They don't play, man. They, they, they weren't playing. Play at all. <laughs> it's not they playing. They didn't play at all. They, uh, they came after George Bush, George D- the first Bush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George H-W. Bush Sr., they went H-W. After H-W. They went after HW. Actually, MTV censored them again. Yep. Uh, by by I don't know if it was MTV, but somebody censored them again. No, I think no, it was MTV BBC. censored them twice. Yeah, MTV censored them again because uh, yeah. they, they, they named George H.W. Bush in one of the songs mm-hmm. at the end. And uh, so Pearl Jam, y'all. Pearl Jam was like the first Kanye. That's how awesome Pearl Jam was. <laughs> now, so when we talk about this, I want to let me say something. So, who are you, some of your favorite uh, artists from the past, from that era, who were, uh, who were in, in your opinion, were doing the best in terms of standing up and, and really taking a stand in, in that same kind of vein? Well, maybe not from that era, all but right, uh, right. from from another era, you got to think about. Uh, well, maybe similar to that era, David Bowie. Yeah, okay. David Bowie okay. was uh, he stood up for a lot of different causes, including. Uh, the rights of LGBTQIA yeah, he communities. Was he was very big and prevalent in that movement. In the movement of just self-expression, self-love, right. he was very big in that. All so right. big shouts to David Boy. Um, you know me, I'm, I, I can't, Do it. can't say go it. without mentioning him. Say my, my, my homie and one of my biggest influences, Do Mr. It. James Brown. Uh, <laughs> say, say it loud. loud. I'm black and I'm proud. I'm black, back in the 60s. 
Yeah. Um, creating, JB did that. Creating anthems for people, raising money. JB had um, juice. JB had juice. I mean, he's not perfect. None of these artists nah, are. Nah, nobody's perfect. Uh, and one more I didn't I didn't write down, and he's very polarizing nowadays. But also Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson brought oh, yeah. a lot of oh, awareness yeah. to human that. rights issues. That's all he did was fight for human rights. Exactly. You know something about fighting, y'all? Fighting. No, who do you, who's your who's your guy though? Um, who who, your, who are your people? I, I mean, there's so many. You know, because so I was born in Flint, Michigan. Lay showers, and um, you know, and I was raised uh, in and outside of Detroit, man. So you know, the Motown situation was there. And so automatically, you know, one of the, one of the album I know I know what's going on front to back. Yeah, a, a, Marvin Gaye. Let's a pro, go. A protest album that Barry Marvin Gordy Gaye. did not want to release. Really? Right. Yeah, Barry Gordy didn't want to release that, you know, because he didn't want to alienate audiences, right? Because Motown was making pop music, For and sure. if you don't know what pop means, pop means popular, to which everybody. means that most of the artists on Motown, the people who were purchasing their music, right, were not people who had the same skin hue as them, right? Right. So Barry Gordy, him being the uh, the forward thinking businessman that he was, he didn't want to jeopardize that type of situation. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, you had, um, you know, uh, what's going on. I know that joint, uh, front to back. Um, you know, when you Thank think you for about, oh yeah, oh, forget, forget about it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, from okay. that era though, I'll throw in fishbone. Listen, public enemy. Shouts to fishbone. Shouts you know, to public enemy. I was Let's listening. Go. Yeah, man. I mean, I was Let's listening. Go. I was listening to mad public enemy when I was young. I was listening to mad you ice tea. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's true, man. Uh, ice tea, NWA. Um, I'm going to tell y'all one that a lot of y'all, a lot of y'all really might not understand, but, uh, WC in the mad circle. Yeah. Like out the West coast, WC from the uh, West side connection. When you listen to his early work, WC in the mad circle, his stuff was the, like, it's brilliant, super conscious West coast, mm. like really talking about, you know, the whole thing with the, with the, with the cops and the, and the unity and the, you know, um, what you might even call um, sort of have a, like Pan-African elements and things like that. Yeah, early WC wasn't on all that gangster stuff, man. Nah. WC in the Mad Circle. That was Coolio, WC, and uh, and DJ Pooh. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's awesome, um, man. But for me, the two biggest uh, joints, man, is uh, just, you know, I got to say it, man. Rage Against the Machine and Wu-Tang Clan, bro. Rage. Rage Against the Machine for me. Yeah, you you know about that, Rachel? You know about Rage Against the Machine? You don't know about that, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. about that Wu-Tang Clan? Like oh, no, we're going to get y'all up on that. Um, Rage Against the Machine. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Uh. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Ah, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. All of that. So um, I'm just saying, they, they, they did it for me. Without getting into it, man. Uh, so That was it, man. That listen, was it. To, listen, if you get a chance, listen to Pearl Jam uh, 10, Pearl Jam Versus, and watch this really crazy music video uh, about Jeremy. And uh, check yeah, it's out. a great music video. It Go is. look at the music video. Uh, and let us know what you think. Yeah, look up uh, Jeremy Uncensored Pearl Jam. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you think. Pass Email the us at pass the bad podcast at gmail.com. IG, uh, everything. Everywhere. We everywhere. Let's get into the next Let's bag. Let's get into the next bag. Rah. Hey, yo. It's in the bag. We got music bags today. Hey, hey. I'm so happy about the music bags. It's in the bag. So we were talking about Pearl Jam, and it led us to the discussion. That was the. The music of yesteryear, right. and this is the music of today. Hey. Warner Music, Warner Music is now Ooh. a publicly traded company. Oh wow! Took them that long? <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was surprising to me that this yeah, was like one I of know, the first. Right? I know, right? Like publicly traded music companies, because <laughs> for so long the doors have been closed. Mm -hmm. You know, people haven't been able to invest mm -hmm. in music mm -hmm. for so long, mm -hmm. unless you, you know, you you built your own record label, things of that nature. But now you can go on the Nasdaq. Go on and get any stockbroker that you want to use, whether it be Webull or Robinhood, whatever the young folks are using nowadays. And you can buy stock in Warner Brother, in Warner Music. Warner music. So who's on Warner Music? Some of your favorite artists are on Warner Music. Warner music. Uh, cool. You got Dua Lipa, who I love, right. really care about a young lady from the UK. Right. Great, great musician. Uh, Cardi. 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 Yeah, Cardi B. Um, and also Ed Sheeran is also an, another member of Warner Music, is and so it's head, is that redhead? Yeah, it's redhead. Why, why do I not hear you as yeah, much? I'm looking at it. I feel like I, like oh, it was the cable. Uh, yeah. The cable. All right, so yeah. you're back. We want to give a shout out to. I'm cables. glad we're listening now. Yeah, you see, you now, see, we got that now. Yeah, Cardi B, Big Cardi Boogie B, Down Bronx, redhead Ed, redhead Ed, Dua Lipa, and they're one of the. The big three. So in the music industry, if you're signed to a major label, you're probably signed to a label that's signed to a label that's signed to one of these three. That's right. Universal, UMG. Sony, 
or Warner Music. If you if you if an artist is a pop artist and you know them, more than likely they're signed to one of these three, or they're independent or on a smaller label. A little factoid for those of you who didn't know that Michael Jackson owned Sony. He had the lo- he had the, the sole ownership of the largest music catalog at the time of his death. Michael Jackson owned more music in the world than anyone. And he owned the Beatles catalog. No, he actually sold the he sold Beatles. That. He sold the Beatles catalog to get uh uh to get possession of Sony. Ah. That's how he leveraged it. Yeah, so he had the single most valuable music catalog in history that he then leveraged for him to get all the rest of the music. So 86 percent of last year's sales for Warner Music was recorded music, thanks largely to streaming. Say what? So eighty six percent of their sales last year, not hmm. ticket sales, hmm. not concerts. But a lot of it was due to streaming. All right. And so All right. like streaming services like iTunes Music, of course, Spotify, Deezer, right. Tidal, you know them, Google Play. Yeah. All of it, that. it brought me to the question that's a very prevalent question today. As artists, as musicians, are record labels still the gatekeepers to, to having a successful music career? Or has the internet and streaming and social media leveled the playing field for independent artists? Ah, I yeah, love you how you always dunking. <laughs> I had to start throwing you oops. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That I'm was a oop anyway. Uh, I'm going to go get it. Check this out. If you ask me, I'm going to say. I asked you. I don't have enough information to be able to answer that question. I can only say what I speculate. Okay. You know, I, I, I speculate that um, the record labels themselves never were the gatekeepers to success, yeah. but that they were casting the illusion that they were. And part of the reason why I say that is because when we study music and we learn about people like Suge, all right, big shout out to the homie Suge, doing hard time. Um, when we learn about people like Morris Levy, all right, when we learn about uh, the type of contracts that people like Robert Johnson and uh, Willie Brown were under, right, these are people who uh, were gangsters, mm. Straight gangsters, right? And somewhere in there, when we talk about business, uh, there's a there's a line between where the music business is and where record companies are, right? Mm. And then where these other influences begin, right? And I think that it's an important delineation for us to be able to talk about. I feel like it's a matter of responsibility when we ask that question. We say the record companies, the gatekeepers, yeah, because we got to look back and see how many of those record companies either were controlled by or answered to people like that, those people. I'm not going to say that's the music business. Mm. I'm going to say people like Quincy Jones. Right. Like, that's the music business. Right. right? I'm going to say people like... Uh, 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 Russell uh, Simmons. Uh, uh, d- there you go. Clive uh, Davis. Definitely Clive. Russell was a, little, was a little bit more diversified, but I'm thinking about those people who were, like, purely dealing in music. And Jimmy Iovine. J- <laughs> Jimmy... <laughs> But seriously, a part of the reason why I bring that up is because if uh, if it's anything that um, that those of us who might have come up around a certain element of entertainment and especially music know is that we know that it's it's a notoriously dirty game. Yeah. And 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 so when you say we're the record labels, the gatekeepers, I personally don't feel like it makes me wonder. You know, uh, were how many of these record labels, if we go back and we actually look at the numbers, and you think about unfair contracts. Mm. You think about artists whose royalties, right? Like the numbers are just absolutely ridiculous. Right. How uh, artists like TLC end up selling, you know, tens of millions of records and then end up broke, right? Like that uh, part of highway robbery that that was taking place. That's that's where I get down, and I say, is is that really is that the music industry or is that something else that attaches itself to the music industry? parasitically and i think that when we look at what the music industry actually was as a gatekeeper we got to be able to separate those two because those two were part of the problem that helped to create the kind of resistance that the streaming services and all the rest of that put up in the first place that's why a lot of those independent things existed because people wanted to make sure that they didn't get taken advantage of and that they didn't get raped as artists you know what i'm saying think about you know stevie wonder blind man they shot heroin in his veins right why to control him right you think about all of these it's, it's it's a real deal problem for artists and entertainers where there's this parasitic, you know, type of thing that's happening where there are people who want to control them. And so I'll say I want to be able to separate the part of me that wants to be optimistic, the part of me that doesn't want to be like super dark right. wants to say that's not the music business. Okay. That's something that attaches itself to the music business like a like a cancer, like a like a like a whatever. And we got to separate. And so I'm going to say because the way I grew up in the States, mm-hmm. because that's such a big part of the business, yeah. I'm going to say I don't even really know what the business actually is. 
if it's not for the presence of that part. Thank you for listening. I would say, I agree. I agree with that. I, I I like the idea that that that's not representative of the music business, but it's more like a parasitical element of yeah, it. Right on. Uh, just like the show business element of it too. Right, right you know, on. Like right drugs, on. sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's not. That's not the music. That's right. just a part of it. Right. Uh, but I want to. I want to talk about the current element of it, like right. the streaming part. Right on. Because. For me, as a as an independent artist, like streaming and social media uh, have helped me get my music to people that may have never heard it before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think because of that, <clears throat> it's beautiful that we have these this the technology and these capabilities nowadays. And uh-huh. now people can sell you know millions of records or get millions of streams just based on them doing grassroots marketing and via social media via building a platform, being a, building a local community. Right. We talk about, let's talk about a homie, the baby, right? Oh, big shot, whoa. The baby. The baby. The baby, he's now signed to a major label, but you know, for a long time, you know, he shopped himself and he only accepted the deal that was right for him. I woke because up a couple on built, my plate. <laughs> he had built a, a, a local following that grew into a, a national following mm-hmm. and now it's grown into an international following. Yeah. And uh, so big shouts to him and other artists that started more independently and they are releasing music all the time. And um, I want to give a big shout out to my to our homie SJ. Yeah, yeah. Who's, uh, oh, yeah. Who now. Ohio's you know, fine. He's, Stand up. He's releasing his music independently. Mm-hmm. And his four, his four most recent singles, all of them have at least 20,000 streams each. That's beautiful. And it's Let's really go, beautiful SJ. to see, to like, for me to know somebody. Let's go, SJ! To be so closely associated with someone who is like doing such big things for Tribe. themselves. And that's doing, and, 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 that, and that's only happening because the music industry has now been leveled in a certain way because of social media mm-hmm. and because of streaming. That so. decentralization has definitely helped to level the playing field in terms of making sure people like SJ don't have to go through. Let's get us. People like Morris. <laughs> I think we might be jumping into the next bag. huh? Is the battery? Is it the battery? The memory car, of course. There's another one in the bag. Oh, the bag's here. Oh, it already ran out? Yeah, it ran out in the middle. Oh, okay. Uh, there's another one in the top top part of the bag. Let's just keep it, at least keep the audio going. Yeah. Uh, but actually, I, like I want that. this on camera, too, because this is important. Actually, let's stop it, and then we'll split this one. You know, I'm right. so uncomfortable with that, because it bring that hood element in. Right. And I'm trying to avoid a certain amount of that hood right. element <laughs> to where sure. it's like, you know, like, you just got, you just got out the mix. That, right. that, you just got out the mix. So, you know. I'm doing my best to we, help. We in the bag. We talking about Warner Music, and it brought us to a question earlier. We talked about some of the past influences of people um, who are making music to reflect what we're doing, what's going on, what was happening back then. Mm-hmm. So who's making music now that reflects the time that we're in? What, what Who's artists? making music now? Who's putting up a good fight now? Killer Mike. <laughs> Killer Mike. Shouts <laughs> to Run the Jewels. Run the Jewels. Oh, oh, let's go, Rachel. Rachel likes Killer Mike. Yeah, Great. yeah. R- yeah. Shouts to Killer Mike. Shouts to uh, Run the Jewels 4. They just dropped that. Listen to that. It's great. My favorite song is Just, J-U, Money Sign T with Pharrell Williams. I stay fucking a hustle, married to a racket. From the first day of class, I started jackets. I slept with a package of the mattress. You know, I love Killer Mike. Yeah. So shouts um, to Killer Mike. Shouts to Run the Jewels. Run the Jewels, Killer Mike. Uh, who's putting up the fight now? Who's really, really pushing the fight forward now? Um, man, let me uh, stop and think about it. Because I don't know. All right, really well, I, I go through my list because I already Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Uh, big shouts to Lizzo. Love Izzo. Yeah, Lizzo, right. she's uh, doing a lot for all body right. positivity all and right. just being honest, having honest conversations about what, is it, what it is to be a woman, all what right. it is to be uh, a, be, uh, uh, a big, beautiful woman. <clears throat> and uh, I love her for that. A bizzle, bizzle, whistle. And she's, uh, she's just real. I love, I love she, Lizzo. Where's she from? From Minneapolis, actually, from Minnesota. I thought she was from Detroit. Nah, I mean maybe I don't know. But Lizzo from Detroit, y'all. That's what know. I call it. I, I heard I she was from, from Minnesota. I heard she was from Detroit and she moved to Houston. All right, somebody That's what look I heard. that up. Rachel, I heard can that. you look that up? Can somebody look up where Lizzo where is, is from? Where is Lizzo from? I'm pretty sure. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure Lizzo is from Detroit. L I Z Z O by way of Houston. But anyway, see right. see what they say about where she's from. All right, what's up? Who else? All right, uh, so shouts to Lizzo. Hopefully, we figure out where you're from. RuPaul. RuPaul Rizzo is uh, really big. It's Pride Month. And I think every every podcast, I'm gonna figure out a way to put RuPaul in. Yeah, yeah, honest. no, yeah, RuPaul. RuPaul is one of, my, one of my. We need big, that collaboration. One of my bigger influences. 
So shout out to her and everything that she's doing for can't LGBTQIA. Wait till I got my suit. I can't, can't, can't wait till I got community. my suit game up. I want to. I want to meet RuPaul, decked out in the, like like with the dope with the, with the ill threads on. Yeah. And I and I I want I want for my first time meeting RuPaul for RuPaul to double take like. Like what are you wearing? Yeah, that'll be a proud moment for me. Yeah, for yeah, I'll sure. Murder, murder. For sure. Again. I, I want to have a ride. I want to meet world. RuPaul wearing all fried rice gear, and for her to be <laughs> like, "Yo, where did you get that?" And oh. I'll be like, "I can, I can introduce you to Maya right now." Fried rice. So shout out to fried rice. Uh, so Detroit. Keep going to get into hip hop. She's from Detroit. Oh. All right, respect. Up, baby. Respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Southwest, East Side, West Side, Hamtramck. HP Northwest. We love Stand her that up, much baby. more. Let's now. Go, baby. I love her that much yeah, more. Yeah. She's from Detroit. Uh. Uh, so shout out to Minneapolis and Detroit and Houston. Uh. So also, Nas. Nas. Yeah, Nasir's still doing it. Nasir Ben Oludara Jones, just in case you don't know. Nas is 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 big to me for like repping for the community. Mm-hmm. I remember uh the album, the the N-word album. Mm-hmm. Um and they didn't want to release it under the title, but he was like, I don't care what it's called. We're going to put the music out there. Mm-hmm. Sly Fox, so many. President's mm-hmm. Black, so many great tracks on that album. Mm-hmm. Always banging on his chest for, for the culture, for, for, for rights for all people. And for more current artists, like really current, um, the two kings of hip-hop are my idea right now in my mind. <laughs> Kendrick and J. Cole. Uh, Kendrick, I mean, do I even have to say why? I mean, those guys... You know they're very conscious of their brand, of their uh, of their community in mm-hmm. their music. Mm-hmm. It's inspiring, but it's also reflective of the community. Uh, Big shout out to uh, Neighborhood Nip, shot because he was pushing it. He was pushing the line. Yeah, he was really pushing the line. All right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think I think so. This is this is this is one of the things like we talk about the current cats. Yeah. The, the people who popped into my mind, especially when you just said Kendrick, was I thought about like I love Q. Like I'm not gonna front. I love Q. The homie, the homie YG. Yeah. I'm not like seeking out his stuff so much right but i'm i do follow what he what he's doing like right. when yg come out with something right. i'll go look at everything to see what it is because i feel like i feel like it, it, especially people who are coming from some place where they're coming from way far away from the side of the fight that is for equality and human rights and things like that you know when you talk about people who you know come up out of uh, you know, neighborhood situations and game banging and stuff like that, and then are able to, uh, you know, find that path toward and use their voice. Absolutely, you know what I'm saying. And Big Snoop showed them the way in, in a lot of ways, you know, on how to be able to do that. How and to Ice be able Cube, and Ice Cube, yeah, too. coming from Ice coming right. from that. Well, Snoop was active though. Right. I think it's different when you talk about people who was active. Like right. Q, Q was active. YG, YG was active. You know what I'm saying. Right. Q, Q was never banging. You know what I mean. Then that's great. You know what I'm saying. Um, Ice, Ice wasn't, uh, you know, Ice was an associate, but he wasn't, you know, part of a, a of a street organization like, you know, YG and a but. But Ice was definitely, he was active. You know, he was robbing, <laughs> robbing jewelry stores and banks and stuff. But I think that it's something to be said about. Like, I love that. So I love Q. I, lo- I love, I love YG. When Q come out with a project, I check for everything. Let's. I want. I want to say. I want to get kind of back to what the initial point is because I think this is a very important conversation for the, for the kids. Cause pass the bag is for the kids. Hey, just like Wu Tang's for the kids. That's right, baby. For the children. That's right. Cause kids are baby goats. It's one of my ex-girlfriends used to say that all the time. Oh, kids are baby like goats. That. The children. <laughs> what up? All right. Investing. Mm. Warner Music is a stock. You can <clears throat> go buy it now. Buy shares. Buy shares. Yes, sir. Investing is a is is a language that you can learn to speak where your money can make more money for you. Your money can become a tool. You know why I'm turning up. Financial education is so, so, super duper, uber, uber important for the future. Because in this, in this recessive COVID pandemic, you know how much money millionaires have, how much more money they have made? Oh, yeah. 485 billion dollars. Oh, yeah, they're cleaning up. Because they know how to invest. Because they know how to invest. The, the name of the game is buy low, sell high. Exactly. And when things like global pandemics come through, they knock the bottom out of everything. So everything is cheap, right? So then you had the opportunity to be able to, when you have right. cash on hand, that's right. another financial uh, uh, term that y'all got to learn. When you got cash on hand, when your company has cash on hand, and then the bottom falls out of everything, mm-hmm. you get to be able to take the cash on hand or to be able to leverage right. the, the stock, the company stock that you do have. And then you go buy up a whole bunch of stuff that everything has bottomed out of. And then, you know, yeah. So the, pass the bag for those of you who don't know. That is 
specifically, that is financial language. It is a financial That's why when we start the, that's why when we start the show, we say what it is. It's not enough for you to get the bag. You gotta learn to keep the bag. And if you don't know how to manage no money, having money, it's just gonna be something you had once upon a time. So yeah, I love that conversation. We wanna make the financial language for the children. We wanna make it easy, you know. So we wanna continue to have a conversation about financial. So if you got some tips that we could share with our younger users about, I mean, our younger listeners, users, listeners, about how to increase their bag, how to increase their financial awareness and knowledge. Let's go. So they can, you know, grow up with more information than we did. Let's go. Please share that with us, passthebagpodcast at gmail.com, at passthebagpodcast, at passthebagpod on Twitter, or in our WeChat group. Let us know different tips you learned when you were a kid, you were a child, about how to invest and use your money to grow your wealth. And Tell pass right the bag. Now. Yeah, let's so do we'll that. get into the next bag, but we love you. Pass uh, that. Uh. All right. This is the this is the maybe the controversial part of the show. Is it controversial? What is controversy? I thought that was a Prince album. Listen, <laughs> y'all. Controversy. We want to get into the band bag. Band bag. You can't bring that bag in here. It's banned. You know, um, not like the band bag, like. Dun, 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 dun. But N N E D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it out, y'all. United States Marine Corps. Shouts to the, all the Marines, all the people in the armed services, all the branches of the, the armed services. Marines, Navy, Coast Guard, oh. National Guard. Uh, Poppy Collar for remembering Air the Coast Force. Guard. Poppy Collar, National Air Guard. Air Force. Listen, y'all. Check it, Army, check Army, Navy. Check, 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 the, check. Check the math. United States Marine Corps, in the midst of everything that's happening, you know what's happening. Protests here, protests there. People get strangled to death on the streets. People fight up, fight for what's right, mobilize. United States Marine Corps, unlike some other organizations, may have gotten the message this time around in a way that is super duper exemplary. They are banning the Confederate flag. They're doing what? Banning the Confederate flag. They're doing what? Banning the Confederate flag. Can I, can I get a oop on that? I want to dunk that. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> banning the Confederate flag. Yo, you know something? For those of you who don't know, once upon a time, there was a war in the United States between two sides, one called the Union, one called the Confederacy, and the Confederacy's economy, uh, uh, the backbone of the Confederacy, uh, Confederacy, the Confederate States economy uh, was uh, these enslaved individuals who were working for free. Facts. And, uh, you Live, know, were born into slavery and died in slavery. And I know a lot of y'all or 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 were brought across the, the sea. Right. Yeah. Right. No, that was probably they didn't even have a Confederate States when they was bringing. No, them over no, 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 no. You know, we got to look at the dates to see when they stopped bringing the boats over. Right. But by the time that the boats stopped coming, the Confederate States were there and the people who were brought over on the boats were then raped, usually. Right. And then Separated their kids, from each other. yeah, their kids, the kids that they had with the people who kidnapped them and brought them over were then kept in the system. Right. And yada, yada. It was a big mess, a big clusterfuck. But this is how the Confederate States made their money. They were making their money off of agriculture. Tobacco was the big uh, thing uh, back then. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was. You know, you would have uh, your plantation. Cotton. Yeah, no, no, cotton cotton actually wasn't profitable until the cotton gin came in. And the mm -hmm. cotton gin showed up only a few years before slavery was banned. Mm -hmm. So that's one that people don't even know about. That's right. part of why they had to set up the prison industrial complex post-Reconstruction, because uh, cotton became profitable so late in the game. Right. So that's part of why the, uh, why the southern states didn't want to let go of the infrastructure that they had set up. That, 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 yeah, that's Yeah, that's the whole thing, y'all. Tell us what you think about that one. Look up when the cotton gin came out. Cotton was not a profitable crop mm. for a long time. So check it out. Here's the thing. Confederate flag. The Confederate flag is banned. The, it, in Germany, right, if you got a Nazi flag someplace mm. out in public, yeah, you can do what you want to do probably in the privacy of your own home. But you go around Germany, Nazi flags, Nazi memorabilia, it's not there. You don't see it. You don't see it. People don't ride around with it on their hats. Nah. They don't ride around with on it. On their trucks. On their cars, on their shirts. Nah. Little stickers on their guitars. Right. It just doesn't happen. Why are we bringing up the Nazi flag? Because for a lot of people, and my man right here is from North Carolina. And the, Virginia. The, oh, yeah. Excuse me. I'm from both. No, I, take, I, I, I carry both of those flags deep in my heart. North Carolina and Virginia. I was born right on the line. Man, I'm going to tell you something. 
you know all of the, the craziest hustlers come from that area. We're not even going to get in that. We're gonna, maybe that's for the next bag. I'm Frank one of, Matthews. Frank. Clarence <laughs> the 13th. Clarence the 13th. Woo. Okay, anyway. So my man come from, he's, come, he's from that soil. Mm. I'm not from that soil. I'm from Detroit. I'm from the Red Dirt. For me, that, that Confederate flag is a little bit, you know, removed or whatever, even though I, I come from the most segregated area of the nation. We have that real sophisticated apartheid up in Detroit. Mm. But, yo, the Confederate flag, the United States Marine Corps is saying, if you're on a base, if you're a Marine, if you're, if you're associated with us in any way at all, we will not tolerate the Confederate flag because we're standing up against what the Confederacy stood for, and that's huge. All right? Yeah. The chances are that all of the rest of the uh, armed forces will probably say we can't let the Marines show us up, and then they'll ban the Confederate flag across the whole Department of Defense, right? Yeah. And then maybe some of these people out here uh, who are civilians or who are retired veterans or whatever right. will help us start to eradicate that because, again, for all of these many black communities right. that are often lumped into as the black community, right. you know, when you see a Confederate flag, you're going to feel some sort of way okay. because you know that the conf Confederacy was about keeping people who looked like you in shackles, working all day for free, somebody laying up on you, you know what I'm right. saying? Taking advantage of it. Yeah, getting, just getting taken advantage so of it in all the worst is, ways. How much of a step is this in the right direction? How much of a step is this in the right direction? It hey, black, what you think? Some, some, some might argue, some people that, that look like me uh, from the Afro-European community might argue that it's not enough, right? It's not enough, you know, it's just pacification. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not from that, from that cloth. Uh -huh. I believe every step forward is progress. All right. You know, and I'm all about progress, whether it be a small step or whether it be a big step. And so <laughs> as a person who would see that flag, and feel and feel disrespected by mm, it, mm -hmm. and feel that it represented hatred, mm -hmm. and that it represented segregation, mm -hmm. and that it represented uh, the annihilation of a certain community or a certain group groups of people from the continent of Africa. I I embrace the idea of government mm -hmm. entities no longer supporting this. I get it. Private private. Where we are from the states, right? We yeah. believe in personal freedoms to an extent, Speak right? Speak on it. At least that's what we put on paper. All right. Oh. That we believe in personal freedoms, right? I feel you. So up. if so, if people want to wear it on the shirt, you know, rock it on their on the truck, whatever. Like you have that right. I'm not gonna try to step on your rights to believe. Yeah. And the just heritage. like walking through the streets with a Nazi shirt on. You can do that. Yeah. You can have a swastika. You can have a swastika. You can wear a swastika. You can have a national. You can have a national socialist bomber jacket. I ain't got, you could be a member. You just got to deal with what comes after the facts. Right. You could be a member of Ku Klux Klan. You could wear a cape. I don't got no problem. You can wear a hood. I, 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 I have no problem with your right to do that. Shout out to the but South. When there are government entities. Government entities like the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi, whose that, flags who fl still feature fl Confederate motifs. Right. Yeah. When there are government <laughs> entities yeah. that support this. Now, this is where I draw the line because. I feel like it is our job as the citizens of a country. I like to how you stand. define that hour. It is our job as the citizens of a country to say that that is not cool. Like our, a government shouldn't represent, shouldn't represent anything associated with bigotry and hatred. How do you feel? I appreciate you know what I appreciate you um, voicing your uh, opinion uh, so passionately uh, and so you know and just taking the filters off for a second and also feel like this man, the whole Confederate thing. You know, when I was a child, I was always taught a couple of things that, that tie into what we're saying right now. They always taught me, you know, if you was on one of these plantations and you were somebody's so-called property, mm. they was going to make sure you couldn't read. Yeah. Because the more literate that you are, that's the further that you are away from captivity. Right. Right? And so being able to read is not just about being able to read books, but it's about being able to read comprehensively things like flags and what they mean and what it is that they represent. You know, mm -hmm. your flag is your identity statement, yeah. right? And so when your identity statement is that these are the economics that I represent. I represent the economics, Mississippi, Arkansas, which my father was born in the state of Arkansas. Uh -huh. I got, man, my, my, gr my, grand my grandmother was born in the state of Arkansas. I have big time clan from the state of Arkansas, right? My sister, nephew, all types of people. So when you talk about a, f a state flag that s that has a motif in there that says, "Yeah, we're proud of the heritage 
of the Confederacy, of, of the Confederacy, which economically built its wealth off of, yeah, this group of people right here, we work them all day, we don't pay them anything, we get the profits of whatever it is that they make to these people over here under, you know, just that type of greed and, and that type of, you know, I, I, I don't get behind that. You know, right. I'm the type of person to stand up and to say, you proud of that part of your heritage? Yeah. Like, I'm like that. I'm like, talk to me about that. So you, can, proud, you proud of that? <laughs> and, and so it asked me. What is what, there to be proud of? Then? When we when this topic came up, it got back, I had the question of what do you think about the heritage versus hatred, you know, conversation, the heritage, not hatred conversation. And again, privately, I, I in the most offensive way possible, Say I think it's bullshit. <laughs> I think it's pure bullshit. Because if what what if we were to what if some group of 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 people from the states were to say you know that, that they were proud of the Japanese internment camps, you know we're proud of this. Yeah, this I is feel our like heritage. people are gonna say that's bullshit. That's bullshit, yeah. right? That people would say that was bullshit, right? Yeah. And how is it any different than what's happening right now? I mean, what's happening with the the Confederate flag? I mean, I don't get it. I I, I feel you about I had. I had ancestors that fought for the Confederacy. I'm, I'm prob- not I'm, proud I'm, of that I'm, shit. I probably did also. I'm not proud of that. I had an, I had a great grandfather who fought for the Union. I had a great grandfather on the other side that fought for the Confederacy. I'm sure I have some relatives I'm who are not uh, proud of either. I'm sure I got some relatives who were rats. I'm not proud of that. Hey, I'm sure I got some relatives who were snitches. Are you proud of that? I'm not proud of that. Are you yeah, proud no, of like no. the legacy of like bigotry and hatred how could you be proud of that like you, how is you know that what? something I'm, that you I'm, embrace i'm like, gonna tell you how i feel about it i feel like bigotry and hatred is what happens on the surface but underneath it is greed right the bigotry and the hatred are mobilized by greed mm. because racism is neocolonialism yeah that's all i gotta say about that <laughs> and that's all i like to say, right? <laughs> say <laughs> the bag has been passed let yeah. us know what you think about the Confederate flag. Should it be banned in all government entities? Let us know. Should it be Pass banned ba- in all public spaces, all like public how they do in the German Republic? Pass the bag podcast at gmail.com. Pass the bag podcast on IG. Pass the bag podcast on Twitter. Holler at us. Let us know what you think. Or please join our WeChat group. Yeah, get at we, us. And, we'll get with and, you. And join the conversation. That's how we do. Be a part of the team. Let's get into the next bag. We had someone in our WeChat group. Shouts to Clayton West. From uh, South Africa. Shout out to you, sir. Shout out to you. And yeah, he, yeah. he he brought in a a, a topic. South Africa. He wanted Republic. us to, to give our our ideas about. And he wanted in his in his cook, the conversation was about religious based discrimination. Religious based discrimination. We're talking about uh, the flag, hmm. talking about the Confederate flag hmm. and, and and the roots of racism. Hmm. But uh, he wanted to us to have the conversation about whether or not there's roots of racism in religion. Hmm. Roots and so I started thinking about well, his question was, what role does do you feel organized religion plays in government discrimination and politics? Organized religion play in government discrimination and politics. politics. That's what I said. <laughs> Whoa. So I was starting to look into the curse of Ham, right? So Ham, if anybody. Hey, big shout out to the Ju- Ju- Judeo-Christian uh, families, you know what I'm saying? Anybody who <laughs> might have uh, studied the Old Testament. The Abrahamic families. The Abrahamic families. The there Abrahamic was a, families. There was a cat named Noah. What? There was a dude named Noah. What happened? He uh, he built a boat. I one. can't stand the rains <laughs> get against my, my window. window. Go ahead, Noah. I, I can't Noah stand and all the little rain. animals. <laughs> look at all the cute little animals. Noah was with Pass all the back. animals. And... Uh, Anyway, he had he had three sons. Mm-hmm. One of his sons' name was Ham, and uh, hard as a mop. Hard as a, let me no. Hey. Sorry, everything turns into a song. And so Ham saw according Preach. to the, according to the story. Preach, brother. According to the biblical story. Let's go. Ham saw his father. His father had been drunk. Well, he was drunk. Mm-hmm. He was passed out in his drunken slumber. Mm-hmm. He was naked. Mm. And Ham saw him naked. Mm. And so Ham was like, yo, so Ham went and told his two other brothers, like, yo, Pop's in there drunk and naked. No clothes. <laughs> and so at the time, I guess it was offensive to have to see someone naked. Sloppy. Sloppy naked. Flapping in the so wind. So in order to, and to finish the story, so his brothers, they got a blanket and they put it on their backs and they walked backwards over to their father and like 
shot off the blanket so the father <laughs> would be covered so they wouldn't this see it. This is a it. super duper Old Testament story. Crazy, right? Yeah, right. And so when the father woke up, when Noah woke up, he was like, Ham, I know you saw me naked, and so I'm cursing you and the rest of your family, especially your son, Canaan. I'm cursing all of them. So God. according to the, Gosh, darn it. the biblical tense, you know, people, some people who want to, to use that. Some people. Some people have used that as a reason to believe they that believe. the descendants of Ham or the Canaanites, which were supposedly of darker hue, which the Bible doesn't say anything about that. That's just something that people <laughs> added. You know, just like the Bible doesn't say anything about the, hey, butt sex is the sex that God can't see. That's one of my favorite ones. I like that <laughs> one. Yeah, That's great. It's that not a sin. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you threw that in there. Uh, so I, I'm glad I threw it in there too. <laughs> Whoop. So now people, hey. certain groups, certain groups have used that as a justification of the enslavement mm. because the 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 curse goes on to say that your Canaan will serve his other two brothers, which were like Canaanites were sum, supposed to be subsidiary to the Israelites. Sub, submissives. Submissives. Not yeah. the subsidiaries. Submissive yeah, yeah. to the I'm sorry. Uh, you gotta, you submissive gotta. to the to the Israelites, mm. and it created this whole conversation about uh, racism being inherent in the Judeo Christian religion. Bring it home. I think that's bullshit. <laughs> 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 I think you go <laughs> for those of you who did. Let, let me do the summary. Let me do the summary. Uh, Noah was like, I saw you in my sleep, seeing me nude. Your curse shall be darkness. Right, darkness, darkness. <laughs> Your skin and the skin of your sons and the, your sons' descendants and stuff like that shall be darker than all of ours, and that'll be your mark that you will then be the servants of the other sons. So that's what it was to about. To answer Clayton's question, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, a lot of people have used that as justification for slavery, mm. for, for racism against black people, mm -hmm. for excluding them mm -hmm. from the clergy mm -hmm. in certain communities. Uh, well, like, what, like what communities? Uh, like Mormon communities. The what communities? Or, Shout out to Utah. You know, the certain, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So certain religions, certain religious sects have used this idea to that, say to say that because yeah, your skin is dark, dark, dark people are inferior. The Bible says, "No one." The Bible never said none of that. The Bible never said it. It never said that. And, and then also the uh, it's just some head. If you think about it's just some head though. God can't if you see think head. about the the curse, right? The curse was from Noah. The curse wasn't from God. God never you know signed off on that curse and said like this is real. This is like <laughs> yeah, like I agree with you, Noah. Like these people are cursed. So like the whole idea is like all right. So a man in a story says these people are cursed and so everybody going to roll with it and God didn't even comment on it. I, I'm going to tell you my biggest my biggest takeaway and appreciation for you getting into this yeah. is just how how bonkers the Torah is. Right. The Torah is so bonkers. And y'all for those of you who don't know the Torah in the Old Testament, it's the first five books of the Bible. That thing is bonkers, bro. Right. All right. And not to disrespect anybody's religious beliefs, you know, like I come from a very very devout Christian family, and I would never want to like intentionally disrespect what people believe because people believe that people believe in the words of this book, and this this book is very powerful, oh, and it is you know it has solved as many problems as it has created. Can we get into the question? Let's get into the question. Well, so, what role do you feel organized religion plays in government discrimination and politics? Based on the uh, people yeah. use it all the time to say gay rights, you know, uh, gay rights aren't 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 valid because you know the Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman, and I'm like, fuck that, that's uh, bullshit. Yeah, you know what? Here's 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 how I get down. I'm I'm gonna take it to I'm gonna take it here. I love I love the example that you gave with the curse of Ham, mm. especially because no, I mean I know people. I, I dated a uh, a Mormon gal when I lived in Hawaii. Actually, she wasn't Mormon. I'm I'm bugging. I dated a gal who was from Fiji, okay, and her parents were from the south of India, and she was born in Fiji, and so she was a Dravidian, okay, dark skinned sister, jet black hair. Um, yeah, I was doing good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she wasn't Mormon, but she went to Brigham Young University. Ah. And she was really tormented and flipped out and freaked out being a dark person and being there in this place where dark people yep. are, you know, cursed or whatever, right? And that they have to, you know, do all of, you know, they put you through all of this extra stuff 
for you to acknowledge that you have been cursed and all the rest of that. For real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In spite, yeah, you have to go through extra rites and rituals or whatever. For, for real? You. Yeah. So check this out, y'all. Even n- having been close to people who have had that experience, for me, first people that I think about, I think about the first crime family, <laughs> the Borgias. I just go straight back to, to, what, to what it is that we learned about corruption from, uh, from, from, from the, the church. The church. Mm. Uh, for, your, for those of you who don't know, uh, 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 the Pope Alexander, who uh, was, uh, was, was, was a patriarch of the Borgia family, uh, whose son, uh, uh, Cesar Borgia, uh, ended up being the white image of Christ, so-called mm-hmm. white image of Christ. Okay, right. Pope, Pope Alexander was a gangster, mm. a, a hard-nosed gangster who became the Pope. <laughs> largely in part so that he could legalize divorce so that he could have his own divorce happen uh, so that he could marry somebody else because he was greedy and he wanted to, you know, consolidate some power. I just look back to the whole thing and I say that type of discrimination is great because for me it brings me back to it separates the racism thing and it says that racism ends up being deployed by these other methods, right? Uh, racism is the henchman of greed. Uh, greed sends racism out to go do, you know, right. X, Y, Z, right? Like right. race and racism, that's the hitman. Right. The hitman work for somebody. Right. So when I think about history and I think about the way that the board I love that. I love that. That's oh, yeah. powerful what you just oh, said. Right I, 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 it's from the, I got it from the Godfather. Yeah. I got it from, that's, that's my Godfather metaphor. For those of you who haven't seen 1972's The Godfather, Francis Ford Coppola, check that one that out. That is a famous movie I have seen. <laughs> it's in the bag. Yo, check this out, y'all. I just want to say it. That's something that for me, where I, I, I look at it and I just say, man, the way that the Borgias did it, you got to look at look at that history, y'all. Look into the way the Borgias took over the church and the, and the way that the church was already a corrupt organization, right? Because they was already doing uh, certain things where, you know, people were stealing money and all the rest of that. But then you had this family that was coming up, this family, this noble family, who was this like notorious, <laughs> like, uh, uh, like family of gangsters that they was just like, we can do it. You know the most. Seg- we can do this. You know what the most segregated. Seg- we can hijack the church. <laughs> you know what the most segregated time is in the United States. Right now. <laughs> no, no, no. Just time. It's time of day during the week. Oh. Like. Oh. Time. Uh, probably noon. Noon on what day? Noon on Sunday. Noon on Sunday. Why? <gasps> yeah, because you got the black church, you got the white church. Like, uh, and churches don't really intermix like that. Mm. And uh, some of that is systemic, dating back to. Dating back to uh, Jim Crow and or even dating back to before that, dating back to slavery, when the slaves had their own religious ceremonies, they weren't allowed to mix with master and his ceremonies and everything. And so like anyway, they, they come down with that book comes down to the next question. How do you respond when someone's core values and beliefs affect someone else's quality of life? And I go back to the analogy of when someone says marriage is between <clears throat> a man and a woman according to my religious beliefs, and because of my religious beliefs, I can't sign off on gay people or LGBTQIA plus communities being able to marry. Well, How do you feel about that? For me, the question, how do I respond when someone else's core values and beliefs affect someone else's quality of life depends on the details of how it's affecting their quality of life. In this example, for example. Uh, In this example about the LGTB stuff. I mean, if a person ain't listening, I say my voice. I'm that type of person. Like, if mm. a lot of times, look, y'all people who are tuning in to pass the bag, you've heard us once. You're tuning in because you want to know what it is that we have to say. But I really am the type of person where I'm, you know, somebody ain't listening, or especially if somebody only wants me to listen to them but they don't want to listen to me, I hit them with the thank you for sharing, which is better than telling them to go fuck themselves. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But I just hit them with the thank you for sharing. If I know that somebody don't value my voice, I save it. And then I just get away from them. You know? That's how I get down. I'm like one of them type of people because – I know about the art of war enough to know that, yeah, any fight that you can avoid, you know, it's better for you to avoid. You only fight when it's the absolute uh, last stance. If they're doing something that's affecting somebody else's quality of life, I'll say something about it, especially depending on what the violation is. I'll be like, yo, you shitting on, you know, especially because you know how I feel about bullies. You know, right. I'm that type of person. If I see you doing somebody else wrong and you're doing it wrong in front of me, then you, you're you attempting to uh, sow uh, an air of intimidation and I don't play that shit. Right. If you slap the person next to me who can't defend themselves, I'm going to make sure I slap you twice as hard as what I perceived you to slap them. You know what I mean? Because I know that after that, you won't hear me. Right. After I slap you, though, I'm, I'm going I'm to let you know what it was about. So, yeah, I'm that type of person. I let them know, you know, look, you on some bullshit. This is the bullshit that you on, you know. Um, and then after that, I keep my distance. I, 
I, I, I was lucky enough to go to a university where they uh, we had we had a training called the Diversity Institute. Diversity Institute. Shout out to Old Dominion University where I went to college. Let's go. Where I went to university uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. ODU. Great school, and very international school. And um, we had a training called the Diversity Institute. And one of the pillars of the training was that you, it, in order for you to truly appreciate diversity, you have to believe that people have a right to believe whatever they want to believe. Right on. You know? And if you can't, if you can't approach the conversation from that point, Let's go, Rachel. then you're not going to have a real conversation. You know, you're just going to be approaching it from your own. That's right. If you can't approach it from the perspective that people have a right to believe what they want to believe, then you'll never truly understand them. How, however, mm. there was the next part of it. Until what they believe encroaches on what an other per, another person's, another human's quality of life. Right on. And I feel whether they listen or not, we gonna have this, I feel like it's my job as the one that knows better mm -hmm. to scream it at the top of my lungs mm -hmm. so they can hear it. Mm -hmm. They gonna hear it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's as important to note what's happening today mm -hmm. in the world that's so important right. is that the people that know better mm. have to speak up. That's right. Not just a people of a certain color. That's right. Or creed. Check this. And out. when this is not when this is not uh this this is not trending news, the people that know better still need to continue to speak up about what's right and what's wrong. And what? it's wrong to encroach on other people's beliefs. I mean, encroach on other people's quality, quality of life, life because I have a certain belief. Let's go. Yeah. Once I was in Thailand in a little town where there was a gal who was well, I was sitting at a table. And there was a gal who was claiming that she was from Detroit. And I'm from Detroit. And so I could look at her and I knew because I've seen people like her all the time who they travel. But if they were in the Detroit area, they would never say that they were from Detroit. Mm. They would have to be from Livonia or Northville or Farmington Hills or Warren or Taylor or one of these other surrounding communities. Right. But when they travel... They have to say that they're from Detroit. Same so way in D.C. She's like, sitting up here talking people, about, people travel, yeah, I'm, like, from I'm from Detroit. DC. You know, you techno, from yada, yada, yada. Now, bitch, you stealing. Right. You stealing. Talking about uh, uh, techno and, and all this other stuff that don't have anything to do from you, right. you know, with you when, in, in, in reality. So I had to hit her with it, you know. Where in Detroit are you from? Right. Oh, oh, well, uh, I'm not actually, uh, uh, yeah, right. yeah. Bitch, you stealing. Right. You know, back, back, relax, because whether you know it or not, that type of thievery, it does encroach on the quality of life of individuals who actually, mm, I don't know, grew up in those areas, has a real relationship to techno, has a real relationship to the culture that right. you want to travel around the world and then claim that you're so intricately connected to. I hope that you're listening, whoever you were, your name, who I've forgotten, lovely young lady. And the, ar <laughs> the, the article that we got was from Psychology Today, and the article concluded that the problem was that sometimes the Bible and the law fulfill the very human need to justify our intolerances and our inaction. You, you know what? I, I, just, I just thank you for saying that. People right use now, the Bible, people use the law to, to, to justify that they're intolerant and that they, they're, they're lazy. They don't want to do anything about it. I'm still it. turning up. I just want to give a shout out to all of them thieving ass neighborhoods that surround the city of Detroit. <laughs> That's right. Up right now. Yeah, yeah, You're saying for it sure. In the most for sure. Way possible. For sure. L L Livonia. Say it with your chest. And Farmington Hills. Say it with your chest. And 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 and, and, and you know those of y'all at Bloomfield Hills. Say it with and, your and, 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 and Gross Point and Let's all the go. rest of that. When you travel around the world, talking about you from Detroit, but when you're in the Detroit area, you're thumbing your nose at Detroit, right? Right. Or when you got, a, or, you know, when y'all moving into a house that somebody was forced out of using mm. uh, racist economic policies, right? Mm. Like redlining coming out of the banks. You know what I'm saying? And all the rest of this. But then you go into the house and you say, oh, what a nice house. I can't believe someone left this house here. Anybody Shout out to house. you. They got kicked out of that. Shout out to you. Shout out to you. Yeah. Yeah. Livonia. Say it with your chest. Yeah. Straight up. Pass the bag. Let's get into the next bag. <laughs> Let's get into the broadcasting bag. Broadcasting bag, y'all. Cops. Bad boys, bad boys, waka, what you want to do, waka, what you want to do when, when you come. come and the lesser known, dun, something bum, called bum, Live bum, PD, hey. have been pulled from television by their network, okay? For those of you who don't know, cops 
has been on the air for 33 seasons. That's a long time. Cops, which was like the original kind of reality TV joint for where sure. people would follow these police officers for around sure. while they were doing their job. Yep. All right. Uh, cops brought that to the table. Following around these cops, going on these calls, mm. and then broadcasting it so that people at home can watch these police doing whatever it is that police do while they are being police now, Human, humanizing, humanizing their jobs, something you know? like, like that. bringing them, bringing us in, bringing us backstage well, behind the curtain. Well, after thirty-three seasons of cops being on the air, mm. and that's a very long run for those of you who don't know, thirty-three years, probably uh, older than a lot of these listeners that we have tuning in. Thank you for tuning in. You know something? Cops started the year I was born. That's crazy. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Fox Network. Fox, Sly Fox. Ran cops for 25 years, and then after they decided that they was going to part ways with cops, cops got picked up by another network, the network that currently has decided not to debut the new season in our current climate. So, number one, shout out to that network for being, um, shall we say... Uh, aware. Yeah, aware. Yeah, aware is Smelling aware. the uh, current climate of things. And, uh, you know... This just this 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 type of thing gets me into the uh, here's in the in the broadcasting bag. Our question is, how many of these murdering cops grew up watching cops? Uh, man, I my my aunties, my my grandma, and like all types of people uh, in my in my family. Mm. Uh, Hopefully well, they're not murdering cops. Not not murdering cops, but not like murdering cops, like killing cops, but killer cops. No, no, they definitely. Watch cops. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really like it. I never liked it. Uh, I didn't like the idea. Of Fanny used to be all over cops. Seeing, exactly. My mom, so I couldn't stand that. I didn't like Ugh. it. I mean, it's not Ugh. that I had anything against cops. I didn't have anything against at the time. You know, as a younger, in the, the younger even version if of they wasn't following police around, it would be it, it, it would be a bo it would it, it's, that format is whack. I, I'm gonna say that. Master P, Master P, who encourages us to always be positive and not say anything negative about anybody, I'm going to go ahead uh. and bend the rules here, right? And I'm going to say, I'm not saying anything negative about anybody. I'm saying something that's negative about that format. Okay. That format is whack. I, I, I just didn't like, I didn't like how it was shot. It was very, I mean, it was obviously very reality TV based, like. Uh, it was before reality TV was reality TV. Right. It was the I mean? first, maybe yeah. one of the just first. Following people around on their jobs. Episodes we wasn't following bike messengers around on their jobs, was we? Right. We went, I we saw a meme. I saw a meme that nobody ever says nobody ever says fuck the firemen because the firemen do their job and then they don't they leave people alone. Bars. <laughs> nobody ever says that, right? You we never heard anybody ever say fuck the firemen, right? We wasn't following firemen around. Right. We I, that would have probably been a better show. Probably would have been a better show. You know, like but anyway, I mean I have there are so many people that are in law enforcement that really do believe in protecting <laughs> and serving their communities. They are the, probably the majority. You know what? I'm so glad that you brought that up because we talked about it in our WeChat group where there was a sister, Tina. Shout out to Tina, who we were having some back and forth. And Tina was challenging some of the uh, assertions, uh, some of the opinions of yours truly. I appreciate you for that, Tina. Keep on doing it. And, you know, it got to the point where when she brought up protect and serve, I said to her, I feel like this is an issue where people mm. are reading and have been reading the situation wrong. Right. I would assert that the cops are doing their job because their job, since they are the enforcement arm of the judiciary it's and the judiciary is part of the state, the cops are doing their job because they protect and, and serve, serve the state. The state. That is their agency. That is their job. So when people see protect and serve and they don't read what comes after that's not written, mm -hmm. and then they say, oh, my God, cops are being brutal. And, oh, my God, cops are doing this. It says they're supposed to protect and serve. But nobody said anything about protecting and serving you. you. They are there as the enforcement arm of the judiciary, and the judiciary being somewhere between what I would say is the heart and the guts of the republic. They are there to protect and serve the judiciary, the laws, the republic. And you, the individual citizen, you are not the republic. So to get into the show, I guess the reason why I didn't necessarily love the show is because I didn't like the idea. I mean, I didn't, I've just never been a really type of violent person to see, you know, whether it be law enforcement. You know, I, I love kung fu movies, <laughs> but there's always like... There's always the clear idea of right and wrong a lot of times in like kung fu movies, or even not even if it's not right or wrong, there's there's character development there. But in the cops, it's just like it's a call. This person did this. Let's go find them. Yeah, that's And there's whack. no clear idea of whether or not you know, it's almost like they're being tried on the show because you would just assume they're guilty. 
especially once the cops start chasing them and then like grab them, put them on the ground, you know, like, you know, obviously, you know, physically harming them. Hey, then, Black, do you have a shell on your back? Because you're snapping right now. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the whole idea of like chasing somebody down. I don't know. And <laughs> yeah, like that's the that's the highlight of the show. Right. Well, there's a bad guy there. Oh, those cops are chasing him. Down. Oh, they've got him in handcuffs. Oh, are they going to search him? Did they find something? Oh, that person was breaking laws. Well, can't wait till they show that again. Right. Yo, 33 years ago, you know what was happening? You know what was happening? 87. Drug wars. Mm. If you don't know that those are crooked, Reagan. go do a little bit. Yo, Economics. Big shout out to Ronnie. You know what I'm saying? The architect. Are we shouting out Ray- Ronnie? No, no, no. Yeah, we're going to yeah, we shout him out. All right. Because I'm going to tell you something. Even super villains, you know, I'm not going to say Ronald Reagan uh, had no. Uh, just, like, just like Donald J, right? Mm. Ronald Reagan was brilliant. Was, was now In his was, own right. In his, sure. in, in his own right, Ronald Reagan was brilliant. Him and his wife. Yeah. He and... Uh, I'm, am, am I behind what they did and what they put together? Hell to the no. All right. I can separate a person's actions from a person. You For know sure. what I'm saying? Yeah. Big shout out to Ronnie. All right? Yeah. So I, I'm not on your much? team. I'm not on your team. I'm working to dismantle what you built, right? But big shout out to you. How much brutality and corruption do you think was left on the cutting room floor? I love this question. That could help get some innocent men and women out of jail right now. I love this question. Or that could have helped solve problems like these before How they much started. brutality? How much corruption? Yeah. Did the did the producers of Cops leave on the cutting room floor while they were filming Cops? Mm. How many camera people caught somebody planting something on somebody who was innocent? How many ass whoopings? How many George Floyd type of situations took place while they was filming Cops inside of 33 years that the producers didn't use for the uh I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Just what say it, what's it? it? Yeah. Big ramp. Shouts to Big Ramp. Big Ramp. Uh, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> want to shout out. out. We want to shout, shout out Big Ramp. All right, get, yeah, get for sure. Big Ramp. For sure. For sure. And uh, coming out of New Orleans, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's my question. I'm like, yo, these producers. Can you imagine that? Can we just wrap our imaginations around that for a second? How much of that stuff was left on the cutting room floor? Man. How many murders do you think that the uh, producers of cops actually witnessed at the hands of police murdering innocent people, and then just just cut it out? This would stuff. be. This would be. Pure speculation, but this is why we have a podcast so we can talk about whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> so pure, purely, That's in the back. purely speculative right now. But I'm sure it happened multiple times. Yeah, I'm sure it happened multiple I, times too sh- over the course of 33 years. I don't know years. that it happened. I don't no. know. This is not. This is a, a big time probability. This is a big time. You're talking about policing in the United States of America, and you're talking about them in, being, in, the, in the 90s in, too, in the, in the 80s and 80s, the 90s, 90s and old when it was cracking in the millennium. When no, when when people wasn't questioning if you had six or seven police officers who were about to do a raid on a suspected drug spot who they're not asking questions they're battering ram in the door and then you got your coked up cowboy corrupt dude jumping in and shooting the first person on the couch right speaking tossing of, a little bit like of, uh, yo. recently this this past week uh would have been brianna taylor's 27th birthday say that thing and this was a young lady who the police went into her house they had a, a warrant uh, for a drug search, but they went into the wrong house. They went into her house, yeah. shot her, and uh, her her boyfriend um, called the police, mm. and they just released a tape, and it of him of his of his call to the police, and it's heartbreaking. It's it's really heartbreaking, and uh, listen to it, check it out. This yeah. would have been her birthday, and we are gonna say her name. Brianna so Brianna Taylor, Taylor. Um, may you rest rest in healing, rest in heaven. And uh, we're not gonna forget, and that's the main thing I want. I want. I want us to always remember. We can't just like let these things forget. Blah, blah, like, it's blah, a, it's blah. a trending topic now. It's a trending topic now. But in a month from now, when, month basketball, from now, when, when basketball, basketball season starts, start, and when, then the, when the COVID six months thing, from now, yeah, when get, football get, season oh, starts, oh man, is are we still gonna be talking about it then? Um, or y'all just gonna be them? Uh, what we call fair weather warriors? Fair weather warriors, and that's why I feel like. But those of us who know better huh? have to continue to have this conversation. This huh? conversation has to be ongoing because if it's just a trending topic now and we stop having the conversation, ain't nothing going to change. So let's get into the next bag. Booyah. Hey, shouts yo. to Cheezus. Shouts to Big Ramp. Right. Shouts to Rachel. Shouts to Nicole. Shouts to the whole Pass the Bag team. Pass Join the, the team. Get involved. Pass the Bag. Uh, hey, yo, my, I got cousins listening. 
What up, Shaya? Shaya Lawson. Shout out to my mom's listening. Yo, Shout yo, out yo. to my mom. You know what I'm saying? Daphne Bryce. Blackstock. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Mighty Soul Teachworth and the whole uh, ball school family. You know Shouts what I mean? We got to get y'all on it. Detroit, yeah. Michigan, yeah. all the family We're out there. This. Virginia, two up, two down. You know Pass it all around. Donald Johnson. All right, y'all. What's, what, what's the next bag? Oh, snap. Oh, snap. It's the ball it's bag. It's the ball bag. It's the ball so, bag. Yo, we were talking it. about the NBA earlier. I'm going to let you intro it. NFL. Yeah. Tell them about it. In Espanol. NFL. Huh? It's, uh, NFL. It's, it's on the deporte. Uh, cuando los grupos. De, no, no, but seriously. Y'all know football. Y'all know what time it is. Roger Hello, Goodell released the statement. Quote, Ooh. we are wrong. We end were wrong. Quote. I'm going to say it one more time. Roger Goodell, Ooh. the chairman of the NFL, oh, okay. released the statement. Quote, we were wrong. Yeah. End quote. Mr. Goodell said that the NFL was wrong not to listen to players from the beginning. Mm. And to give you some context about what the beginning was, big time CK, Mr. Colin Kaepernick, who still don't have a job. Still don't have a and job. And don't let us list the dudes who have jobs mm. over Colin Kaepernick at the moment. Right. Yo, Colin Kaepernick took that knee. Colin Kaepernick, in, when people ask. In response asked, to. In response to, to what? To people getting murdered by the cops. To police brutality. How long ago was this? Uh, this At was least what, three? five to yeah, seven years. Yeah. No, it's been like five years. I was going to say point. three, four. Maybe it's been, okay. I don't know exactly when he first took the knee, and that's something. Can, that, can y'all look that up for us? Can you when see did, when, uh, when Colin Kaepernick first took that knee? When did Colin Kaepernick first take a knee? We're going to get out. Check this out, though. PA so the up. man so the man took the knee. When people said, what you taking a knee for, Cap? Mm. He told them. You know, a lot of brutality that's happening out here in the community. Yep. I'm not feeling it. Nope. So I feel like uh this is my statement. Oh, it was it was it was a he and Air Reed? Yeah. It was him and another Air No, Reed. it wasn't Air Reed on his team. It was him who It was, was he and another team. brother who was on another his team. It's a team. conversation that they yeah. had that actually inspired them to kneel. Yeah. Uh I think the other brother stood up before Cap. Yeah. That's why Cap became the focus. But if if, if I'm if I'm uh Well doing no, Cap was the bigger player. I All mean, right, cool, was, cool. He was Thank the quarterback. You. Thank you. you know? So yo, so Cap is taking a knee. And then people asked him, people like Roger Goodell. People like the owners, they asked him, they said, why are you taking the knee? And then when he went to tell them halfway through, they was like, oh, we ain't trying to hear it. Nope. We ain't trying to why hear it. Why weren't they trying to hear it? Why weren't they tr- What was Pro- their beef? Probably because they were racists. But no, what, what did <laughs> the, they say their beef was? Oh, they said their beef was, uh, it's called, for those of you who don't know, it's called the deflection. Uh, the deflection. Because they made it about the... You're disrespecting service members by taking a knee during the national anthem. You're disrespecting the flag. We don't want to hear what you're saying about police brutality. We don't want to have a conversation about this part, and instead we want to deflect and we want to make it about something else. When was the knee? Did you find it? Two thousand sixteen, so August four 26th, years ago. Two thousand sixteen. Yo, big shout out to oh, that Colin was Cameron. early. That was with preseason. Yeah, they was doing. He was doing it. Ah. They was doing it. They was doing it. And people didn't even notice until it became a news story. It became, it became a trending topic. Oh, they were not listening. And then everybody had an opinion about it. Somebody out there still not listening. His name is? His, no, he's listening now. <laughs> oh, oh, he's listening now. He's listening okay, now. Okay, great. We'll let get, back. No, you tell the people about that one. All right, so. In the beginning, though, he definitely wasn't one listening. Of the, one of the greatest quarterbacks of, our, of the modern era. Hey, Shorty, little, uh, little Swiss, what's the name of your football squad? Say it loud. The What's Saints. the name of your football squad? Black and gold. The Black and Gold. The she New said Orleans the Saints, Saints for those of y'all the who can't hear. The quarterback of the New Orleans, shouts to New Orleans, the quarterback of the New Orleans Saints for the last, what, damn near 20 years. I know, Has right. been a name, Drew Brees. Drizzle Brizzle. And Drew Brees came out and was like, I still, I, 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 I ain't got nothing to do with anybody, I'm paraphrasing, I ain't got nothing to do with anybody who would disrespect the flag. And everybody was like, Really, Drew? Really, Drew? Really, Drew? That's what you got to say right now? Really, Drew? Like, this of, is the best time for you to say that? all the things that of you could be saying you could right say, now. right, Drew? This is what you say? <laughs> like, this is, this is what you believe, Drew? Bra, bra, bra. Come on, Drew. Drewy. Buddy. Drewy. Guy. Drewy. Buddy. Drewy. Bro. So, Broseph. So, a lot of people called him. A lot of people called him out. Some of his teammates actually put in a phone call to him, reached out to him. And uh, reached out to him via their social media, but also like personally reached out to him to let and, him know. and let him know like how ridiculous the statement that he just made was. Mm. That can he mm. continue to believe a, a rhetoric? What? I 
Ah. Can I say it in the most extensive way? That's possible? what. That's what I was. <laughs> he continues to believe the bullshit the that bullshit. somehow protesting against police brutality is somehow disrespectful of the flag. Yeah. And it's not honoring his ancestors who fought in the war. Like our ancestors, yeah. like 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 Afro-European ancestors didn't fight in the war. Yeah. Like like like. I'll say so when your grandpa. All right, I'm not even gonna get into it. No, no, no. All right, Drew. Be in there, cause Drew, we gonna get in the grandpa, bag and then we gonna hop When out. your grandpa came back from the war, people mm. praised him. They got parades. I'm sure he got discounts everywhere he went. Yeah. He got uh, free cigarettes. Yeah. People wanted to give him alcohol. Yeah. But when my ancestors returned from the war, what happened? Nobody gave a fuck. Nobody Say gave again? a fuck. Actually, they did give a fuck. Uh. They gave a fuck so much that they created laws in order to just to, uh, segregate them. Absolutely. Because and their agency was more threatening because they just got back from a war, mm. just got trained about how to mobilize, just got trained about how to be able to run ops, mm. just got trained about how to be able to do things like take people who weren't soldiers and create soldiers out of them. So, oh, yeah, people gave a fuck. Yeah. And they made sure that individuals who looked like you and I who came back from the war had a harder time than they did. Before they went into the war. Which is craziness. So, uh. Drewy, Drewy makes that statement, and then his teammates reach out hey, to Drew, him. Hey, Drew, you need a decaf cafe latte, buddy? His, 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 his teammates reach out to him and say, Drew, you're misguided. Let's educate you on what's going on. And so, Drew stepped it back, issued an apology. But the reason why I felt like Drew has learned in certain ways, because 45... <laughs> 45? This is, this is in the recent, like, in Donald the past J. Few days. Queens. Donald J. Queens. Queens. Stand up, Queens. <laughs> the worst thing to ever come out of Queens. <laughs> Donald J. Uh, <laughs> made a statement uh, on Twitter. Uh, he was like, Drew, J. you shouldn't have apologized. You should stand by what you said. They're disrespecting the flag. Donald J. got your back, Drew. Fuck him. And, uh, and then Drew came back and was like, Donald J., Donald J., I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Like, people have pointed out to me oh, that the black wow. community has been taken advantage of for so long. Wow. And their rights have not been acknowledged. And wow. us as the whites... I, us as the white community should know better, need to do better, and need to do a better job of of speaking out against this indignation, wow. racism, and bullshit. Wow. How about that? Hey, and I so, can dig it. I can dig it. Hey, Drew, way to pull it back. Way to apologize. Hey, Drew, way to go ahead and disrespect. I mean, sorry. <clears throat> disagree with 45. Right. I, would, I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, we're not disrespecting anybody, but way to disagree with, uh, not with, 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 with 45. <laughs> Feeling disrespected is one thing. Blatant disrespect is another. Yeah. Yo, how large of a step in the right direction is this for the NFL? Going back to the flag, man. Any step, any step towards, <laughs> any step, any step. How big, man? How big of a step is this if in the right it's direction? It's a small step. It's, it's a, a big step. step would be somebody giving Callan Kaepernick a job. Whoa. That would be a big step, oh, right? Oh, I like how you just said it. That Say it again. A, that would be a big step. A Say big it again. step would be like What's his name? reinstating Colin Kaepernick. What would Say they give him? Name. Give him a job, man. Yeah. Give him a job. Yeah. You know, like. That's, yeah. what, that's what racism looks like. For people who actually don't know uh. what racism is, uh. racism is economic. Yeah. It's when you mobilize yeah. institutional power mm -hmm. against someone yeah. based on their stance right. that they take that goes against you being able to ensure that your greedy, uh, uh, thieving ass yeah. uh, is ripping people off Let's based go. on uh, these, uh, you know, false boundaries Say of, that. of, of uh, you know, the, the whatever, Say right? That. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's hey, what that's what racism. That's makes. what racism Using looks like. Racism looks like Colin prevent. Kaepernick not having a job when he's better than X amount of quarterbacks for sure. who do have a job. For sure. And, and those I, quarterbacks will tell you that he's better than them. For sure. For that's sure. what racism Ain't actually looks like. Ain't racism looks like people getting pushed out of their houses, right? Pushed out of their homes by banks. You know what the New Orleans Saints should do? The New Orleans Saints ah, should ah. bring in Colin Kaepernick to compete with Drew Brees for his job. Whoa, that would be fun. You heard I'm it here first. I'm the New sure. Orleans Saints signs Colin Kaepernick. If Colin Kaepernick was Drew Brees' backup, that would be the sweetest poetry ever. Right. Yo. That's what we need right there. Yo. That would be justice Yo. in my eyes. All right, so. I so. ain't asking him to let the man start. He ain't got to start. He just need a job. Right, there's so. three backup quarterback positions on every team. There's like, what, 32 teams? You mean to tell me there's like 90? There's 90 quarterbacks better than Colin Kaepernick? I, no, I don't believe. Hey, look. At least see the look in my eyes. Nice I'm sorry. I was just blinded by the bullshit. <laughs> I was just like, whoa. Let's what go. the fuck? That many people better than Colin Kaepernick? I don't believe it. Let's get into the next Let's bag. Let's get into the next bag. We're getting into our, 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 last, our last official bag of the day. We got a new bag. What you know? it is. Baggage claim. Hey, yo. 
Badge Claim is all about relationships. Hey, yo. And we at Pass the Bag, we love to, to, to have a, a whole, a whole a role-rounded conversation about health, community, and culture. Oh, and yeah. one part of health is sexual health. Sexual health. So in the baggage claim today, we were talking about porn, sexuality, and the ever-changing world of sexual fantasies. Porn, sexuality, the ever-changing world of sexual fantasies, integral parts of health, except for porn. So most, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Most sexual fantasies fall into three distinct categories. Whoa, three? <laughs> most sexual categories fall into most sexual three fantasies. Fall sexual into fantasies. Oh. Three categories. Three. I like the that most number. prevalent being group sex. Hey. Second one being novelty. Hey. And the third being power and control. Whoopsh, whoopsh. More than 95%. Hey. <laughs> more than 95% of men and 87% of women have fantasized about group sex. Have they now? Yes. Half of men and one third of women fantasize about it often. Half of a man and a third of a woman? That sounds like a different uh, sexual category. <laughs> that sounds no. like a different conversation. <laughs> Women and men who viewed the same fantasy over and over again eventually become desensitized until they, till they were given something new. So mm. there was a study mm. created by this guy, um, Justin Lay Miller. Shout, shout out him. to him. He, he, he looked at, he, they, they put people in a, in a lab and they showed them the same sexual fantasy and eventually, initially they were very aroused. Yeah, it was yeah. something they were into. Yeah, but yeah. the more they showed them the same image mm. over time, mm. the less aroused they became right. and then, until they replaced it with something new. Ah. So this is how... Novelty. This is novelty. This is how porn addiction works, right? Oh. So is porn, if you watch, is porn addiction a real thing? Yes. Chemi porn addiction chemically, is chemically, it's definitely a real thing. Dopamine. Yeah, word up. Tell, dope, tell the people. Porn addiction is real. It's real, y'all. So is it important to have ongoing conversations with your partner about sexual desire? If you have a partner or, yeah, that's my question. What is do you it, think? Hell no. You just keep all your sexual desires to yourself, and they just <laughs> jump out at each other. And then when the other person doesn't do what it is that you want them to do, mm. then you get mad at them. And then you're, hell yes, it's important, man. Yeah. You, you know what's, you know something? Listen, y'all. I know. United States, People's Republic of China, our two main audience places are places where there's a puritanical element that exists. Mm. And that puritanical element tells you that there are certain conversations that you don't have at the dinner table. There are certain conversations that you don't have if you're a lady. There are certain conversations that you don't have. And that is all fuckery. Flush it down the toilet with the rest of the boo-boo. Because, uh, yeah. yeah. Every day that goes by that you don't manage, actively manage your relationship to human sexuality yeah. is like taking the number two and not cleaning yourself. Yeah. It's nasty. It's irresponsible. You need to do it. It's social hygiene. Yes. If you are active, if you are considering being active, don't be too cool. Don't be afraid. Talk with your partners. Cultivate trust. When there's sexual tension, address the sexual tension. It's just like anything else. Yeah. The more that you do it, the better that you'll become at it. And then maybe one day in the future, you will be like some, you know, Billy D. Williams, Elizabeth Taylor, super sex machine, you know, cool with it. But you don't have to be cool in the beginning. Right. In the beginning, what you have to be is responsible. Facts. Have the conversations. Yeah. How else do you expect to get to what it is that you want to get to if you're not sharing with the people who are willing and able to help you have the experiences what it is that you're into? Yeah. You like feet? Get some feet in your life. Right. You like uh, dirty panties or, you know, uh, gym clothes? Get, the, get Just get it out there. Right. Just get it all out there in the beginning. You so like you like being spanked or spanking others? Wha bam. There's wha -bam. communities for wha -bam. BDSM wha -bam. and power wha -bam. And control. Wha bam. So what you think? I think I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, there, and also another reason I agree is that because if you don't have the conversations, you, you run the risk of of internalizing these beliefs and con and convincing yourself that there's something wrong with you. Definitely, there's nothing wrong with you. 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 If you if you want to if you want to take a penis and sing into it like it's a microphone and do show tunes and that's what you and your partner get off on, then do that. You're probably a really unique couple. Right. But hey, do that. Nothing do that. is wrong with you. Sing there's them nothing, show tunes. There's nothing wrong with having conversations about fantasy, having conversations about what. Uh, what you might desire, right. and the desires that are in your mind, 
That's right. Have no reflection on who you are. That's right. You know, the mind right. is an incredible tool, mm -hmm. and it, it has no limitations. Mm -hmm. And you can think up anything. Mm -hmm. And if you and by speaking on it, especially with someone that you love and you trust, you can you can maybe even explore some of these fantasies, but even just explore the idea of it. I think this one is super important, especially for like we said, the young listeners, yep. right? Because I know I don't know what your uh, experience was like, but my experience growing up, okay. Now you know I I think I was a little bit different. I was definitely bold. All right, I was bold, so I was the type of person who I was having conversations about sex and sexuality. Um, maybe uh, before a lot of my peers were, and in a way that would be considered, you know, very adultish or, you know, whatever, whatever. But the point is that the wor in the world around me, there was a lot of people around me who, yeah, there was all types of stuff that they wanted to do that they wasn't talking about. Yeah. And to me, that's crazy. That's like, you know, I want to fly a plane, but I don't ever want to talk about, I want to have conversations with this person who's going to be my co-pilot about flying a plane, we're just going to sit next to each other and start pressing buttons and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. Thank you. That's a great analogy. <laughs> oh, man. So what role, <laughs> speaking of pressing buttons and stuff. <laughs> speaking of pressing buttons. Hey. What role do you feel porn plays in sexual desire, boop, and do you feel it's boop, healthy? Boop, 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 boop. What role do I feel like porn? That's the thing. You know, porn is such a large, um, I mean, porn comes in so many uh, forms, right? You know what I'm saying. You have um, uh, slasher porn, that's still porn, right? I know we're talking about sex and sexuality, yeah. But watch how it tied us in. You have uh, what's that? Uh, ruin porn, that's still a type of porn. You have all these different types of porn. You have all of these different types of things that are there to titillate and excite people, and you know, get their uh, juices flowing. And then they take that energy, and then they use that energy, and it goes into the sexual channels, and uh, they sexualize it. So I feel like when you ask that question, you say, uh, what role does the, the, do I feel porn plays in sexual desire? Look, erotic materials themselves are great. Mm. Erotic materials themselves are fantastic. They're, the world is better with them than without them. I think that, you know, that thing about the, the way that the erotic materials are weaponized by being put on formats where, you know, people sit back and they – have these algorithms, you know, as to how to get people to get the dopamine hit with the click and all the rest of that. You know, that happens in a laboratory, a laboratory, someplace where somebody, you know, wants you to fuck off your time and your energy and all the rest of that. But me personally, the role that I feel that porn plays in sexual desires, one, porn is a very vast net, right? Mm -hmm. So different types of porn play different types of roles, For sure. right? But I'm going to say the, the world is better a, 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 as, as a result of having those things that increase arousal and all the rest of that by having them available mm. is by using them responsible is where the whole thing kicks in and right by, and, and by that's being educated it. about it let's and that's go that's where i'm gonna go with Alley -oop. <laughs> Woo. behind the back <laughs> all right so nine and a half billion of the 28 and a half billion views on porn porn hub i think last year came from the state porn hub send those checks yes i'll take a porn hub check i without having to pull my dick out as someone who <laughs> that's great as someone who quit porn, oh, congratulations. Uh, I'm about a month in the in the no porn game. Okay, no no porn. Hey, I think I definitely haven't quit the porn. The research supports that porn can become an unhealthy addiction. Yeah, much more easily than a lot of things. Exactly, because it takes it takes access. It's all right. Fuck it. It takes access to. It gives you access to your drug at any point in time because you have your phone in your pocket at all times or you have your laptop at your desk and on your computer. You have so much access to this thing that can be very, very scary. And, and that, very that access is dangerous. And oh, very that was way unhealthy. off key. And very <laughs> unhealthy. So I don't feel, and also I don't necessarily like the way sex is portrayed in porn. Oh, and most, I'm going to go ahead and say this. And you say, I don't necessarily like it. I'm going to say, for the most part, it's hella whack. Right. It's hella whack. Yeah. And it's not realistic to what uh, a fulfilling sexual relationship actually looks like. And that looks different for every person. I don't watch any porn that isn't blatantly ridiculous. In what way? Like, I, you, know what I, you know what I can do? I can handle group sex porn. Uh -huh. that, much, that, that I can handle. To... Uh, for a larger group, all right, because group sex looks all types of ways. For sure, and you know I've only had so much of it. 
<laughs> but the point is that, um, no, really, I would rather watch somebody doing crazy tricks, you know, a, a lady shooting a Nerf uh, football out of her butt, you know, uh, somebody who's, uh, uh, you know, just, just stuff that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I would rather watch stuff that makes absolutely no sense and then get off watching that than I would watching someone. But did you start there? Did I start there? Um, the first time you looked at porn, did you look at nope, something that nope. was completely ridiculous? Nope. And that's how it works, right? But, but the first time that I looked at porn, I did look at it with a critical eye. And I do want to talk about this part. This is great. I'm glad that we get to talk about this. Yeah. I can remember the first time seeing porn, like most people, I was, you know, super young, and it had to be explained to me. Okay, this is people, you know, you're not sexually mature yet. People grow up. They grow into sexually, uh, sexual maturity, and then they explore sexuality together, and this is a depiction of that, yeah. right? So that last part, this is a depiction of that. Uh -huh. I knew what it was to be an actor or an actress, mm. right? I knew what it was to have a job. Yeah. And so the way that it was explained to me is it was explained to me this is how people pay their bills. Yeah. This is a job. Yeah. So I automatically knew, right? Because I knew with, uh, you know, having thespians around me and all the rest of that. I knew this isn't real. Right. Right? So that from the moment that I did start viewing porn either recreationally or gratuitously, I knew that the people who I was looking at were portraying something. Yeah. They weren't, do this wasn't reality that I was looking in on. Yeah. It was people who are, they're getting paid to portray reality. Right. If you had given me the option to look at people doing ridiculous stuff, uh -huh. Or to look at people who are not doing ridiculous stuff. I could tell you that I, I, I took so many hours dodging, dodging things that were, that, were, that were trying to make it look like what people are doing, you know, in the privacy of their homes. Because I knew that it, w it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit back and look at a gal who, this, this is her job, for her to be uh, much more sexually engaged uh, uh, than the average woman with people yeah. who she doesn't have an emotional attachment to. She doesn't get lubricated anymore. They got to uh, give her the, uh, the, the bottle of lube in between sets. That's not sexy to me. Mm. I don't want to look at that. Right. right. I'm avoiding stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Looking at uh, people who do, you know, just guy just slamming away at a gal, you know, no connection. You know, right. you look at the dude, he's, you know, daydreaming somewhere. Right. right. You know, it, God knows it's just early 90s, right. late 80s. He's probably on coke. Right. You know what I mean? Like all of this kind of stuff, man. No, yeah. So I think it's an interesting question that you ask. If I had been given the option to be able to look at people do circus porn, <laughs> I probably I might have chosen it because mm. I like freaks and weirdos. Right. Yeah. Like I might have wanted to see a lady, you know, sit on a cake. Right. For me, and I be think, stupid. I think for me, one of the reasons I quit is because I didn't want to see how much further I would have to go in order to get aroused ah. based on the dopamine. The gotcha. dopamine rush, right? Because gotcha. that's how it works. The study, the study by Justin Lee Miller showed that if you would see, if you see an image that initially aroused you, over time it would stop arousing you. You have to get go for something else, different or even more extreme. No, I understand that part. So it's like I don't want to be on that slippery slope. Yeah, I, I totally like understand that part. Not getting all to what I, I used totally, to get I off totally on. understand that part. Because then it's like, all right, so now I got to go for something different. No, I totally understand that part. I can, I can, I can tell you straight from the jump. The stuff that, the stuff that I feel like. I used to uh, have to watch, you know what I mean, simple stuff, you know what I mean, butt sex, blowjobs, right, group sex, right. you know what I mean, like, I can get off on that the same way now that I could when I was 16, right, Right. but for me, I just always felt awful, <laughs> I'm sorry, no, you're good. I always felt awful looking at the gal who was like, you know, she's, put, she's, she's putting her vagina to work yeah. in a way that, like, is, is, like, for real, it gave me bad feelings, I was like, right. From what I understand of human sexuality, it's important for her to, you know, probably most of the time having them, even if it's not an emotional connection to this guy, right. a connection to her experience, right? And and, 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 I, and I was just looking at it, and I was like, oh, it's, it's, I'm glad you brought that I'm up. Like, th this hammering away that's happening is like probably is a high probability that it's damaging or ruining a part of her, and I don't want to look at that. And 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 it, the study also <laughs> pointed out yeah. that it's it's important to note that. That emotional connection is important for females, of course, <laughs> when it comes to sex. You know, that's something that we yeah, all know. Yeah. It's common knowledge at this point for those of us who are woke. But what about, but it's also important that, that men find a certain level of fulfillment and emotional connection through sex, too. And that the study pointed out that um, men getting off to certain kinks involving, involving uh, an, a, a, a boost of their ego. Kinks? Yeah, a, yes, bo please. a boost of their ego is in, is in some way fulfilling, you know, the emotional 
idea of what it means to be manly. Oh, my God. You're so strong Does that and make big. Sense? You know, that makes yes, sense? I'm strong and big. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I, I feel like that, those conversations, is not just an ego play, but it's also a play of a reflection of finding value in sex. Yeah, right? absolutely, man. Absolutely. Just like, so. It's women, a party. It's a party. Everybody wants to feel valued. It's a party. Everybody wants to feel yeah, loved. Yeah, we want a party. Right. We want to be able to celebrate that part of ourselves in a way that's fun, you know, and f- celebrate that part of somebody else in a way that's fun. What do you think? Let us know. What do you think about porn? What do you think about. Uh, having s- s- conversations with your partners, with your friends about your sexual fantasies, about coming open with these ideas, talking more openly, taking it out of the tab- taboo realm and bringing it to the mainstream. If you have children, yeah, be smart. Yes, don't be a chump. Don't be a chump. Be a champ. Don't don't be scared to talk. Know to how you. to have ongoing, comprehensive conversations about with sex and sexuality with sure, your children. They gonna talk about it. They're going to talk about it with somebody. They're going to get their information from somebody. From somewhere. And, and if they don't get it from you, because they're going to. Just like everybody else. You would hope that they get it from you. They're so getting they, horny. Yep. They don't have to ask to get horny or to yep. be horny. It starts at like 12. Yeah, if you, <laughs> earlier <laughs> right? in some cases. Earlier too. in some cases. If you, if you, if you want to make sure that, and, and that's a really important way to be. Now, how about that? As we end it. Yeah. What's been your relationship to being able to have comprehensive conversations about sex and sexuality? Horrible. With your, with your, Horrible. Yeah. Shouts to my mom, but you did not do a good job with yeah, that, Yeah, I'm going to give a shout out to Fanny. Uh, you did No. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, straight I up. I had conversations with people about sex, and it wasn't my mom. And I wish I could have conversations with my mom earlier when I was a child about sex, but she couldn't handle it. And I respect that. That's okay. My mom's not perfect. She knows she's not perfect. I shout know out to moms. Perfect, but I love her. And shout she loves me. And she supports me. And hey she's y'all. beautiful. Hey, y'all. So shout out to my mom. Kids, or if you have kids and you're listening, don't be afraid to challenge your parents. Hey, I'm going to give you the language. You can say, for my personal development, I feel like it's important. And for our personal development as a family, I feel like it's important for us to include comprehensive conversations about sex and sexuality yes. in our family culture. Yes. So while I understand that you may not have had examples yep. or this may be uncomfortable for you. Yep. This is a moment for us to come together and grow and grow in health. Indeed. Hey, yo, pass the bag, pass the bag. Hey, yo, let's get into the, let's, let's get into the last bag of the day. Booyah. Save the last bag. Save the last bag. The last bag of the day Sizzling is save. our PA check in. Yeah. Um, to check in with our, our lovely, beautiful human um, assistants. Wonderful human assistants who help to make Past the Bag podcast all that it is because we cannot do it alone as well as we can do it with their help. So we're going to invite up our assistants for today. Hey. Miss Rachel. Hey. Miss Jesus. Hey. Jesus herself. That's right, baby. Gouda in the up. building. Come you know what up. I'm saying? Freaky feta. Come on up and... Uh, so we want you guys, you ladies, That's right. to tell us about what part of the podcast today spoke to you and anything else you want to share and share your social media and, and whatever else you want to share. Young Cheezus. You can come over on this side. Yeah. Uh, so many things, uh, I think, spoke to me today. I'm trying to remember. Uh, well, here's the rundown, in just in case you want to uh, uh, go through that. No, um, when you said that people's people's beliefs like you shouldn't have somebody's own personal beliefs shouldn't infringe on other people's like right to human life or quality of life you yeah. know that really really spoke to me nice yeah i think that that was probably my favorite uh thing but there's so many just good things and tell us about big ramp yeah kenneth ramp wade hey i hope you're yeah i hope you're watching right now yeah me and uh big ramp we were uh extras together uh queen sugar and i did like a Helped him film a promo video because he actually is part of like a wrestling WWE. I think it's a more underground wrestling. Nice. Yeah, and he's 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 actually he um he's I think he's uh, he's a radio DJ for Q93. Yeah, he's he's a he's a well known he's a well known guy in in New Orleans locally, and I, I had the pleasure of getting to meet him and. Uh, I support him, and I just I'm so happy that we can connect and that we're friends. So I hope you're watching Big Ramp. I Shouts support to you. Us. Yeah. Shouts to Jesus helping yeah. us out. Yeah. And uh, you can catch you can catch her at all of these. Uh, she's a fantastic uh, fantastic talent. Uh, a woman of uh, of of many uh, facets of entertainment and depth and soulfulness and beauty. And so we want to thank her, and uh, we will make sure that we include uh, her social media. Show. Yeah. Uh, Siren Slumber, S-I-R-E-N-S-L-U-M-B-E-R. 
Hey. So Rachel, what part of the what part of the pod spoke out to you today? That's right, Rachel. Tell rainbow me. Bag. Rainbow, the rainbow bag. Rainbow bag. Rainbow bag. Yay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Because uh, I remember last year I was in Leeds. I went to the Pride Parade. Where is Leeds for the people at home who don't know? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's in North England. Hey, United and Kingdom. Yes, the United Kingdom. Hey. And uh, so last year I was there. And then I think back then I thought I was like 100% straight. But mm. I still like I embrace everyone's, you know, their, their you know, sexuality or oh, whatever. So that's right. Swervy curvy. Swervy curvy. It's not always a straight line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always a bit curvy. And uh, this year, like recently, I have a new bis- discovery of myself that I'm, I'm not like that straight. Mm. And then I was talking to my friends about that because I was so confused. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like, why do people always say, oh, you're straight or mm-hmm, you're gay or mm-hmm. what? They're trying to define you. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. recently I just have this new discovery. I I'm like, oh, maybe I'm like 50-50. I don't know. And which is a great thing. Yeah. Like, Aye. So, Aye. Uh, so like, uh, so about Pride Month, I just want to say like, People should love whoever you love. Let's go, baby. Like, it doesn't matter. Let's go, baby. Their gender or, you know, just you just love them as a human being. That's right. Yes. Everybody is worthy of love. It ain't even got to be about love. You can fuck whoever you want. That's right. You can fuck whoever you Yeah, man. Fucking is, is, is important now. Yeah, it's important. Protect yourself. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. One of the ways that you protect yourself is by making sure that you respect people. By making sure that you hear their voices, that you don't get involved in this sort of intimate activity where people are so vulnerable without letting the other person know what you're looking for from the experience. Asking them, asking them what it is that they're looking for from the experience so that you can make sure that things match up and that you don't set yourself up for something that's going to be disappointing and not as healthy as it could be. Foreplay. Intercourse, aftercare. aftercare. Hey, <laughs> for play. Intercourse, aftercare. Hey, for play. Intercourse, aftercare. Hey, hey, hey. Pastor hey. Bad. Pastor Bad. Thank hey. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for checking in. Excuse me, let me. I shut yes. this mic. Cause it's not enough to get the bag. You gotta know how to. And if you want to keep the bag, you got to share, share the, the bag. bag. Thank you to our PAs. Thank you to all of you. Now kindly pass. The bag. We'll see you next week. Uh, Thank you.